Whoa, 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 whoa. Stop that mix, rock stars. Isotope, Native Instruments, and Plugin Alliance are running the, the Summer, Summer of, of Sound, Sound sale, sale right now until July 6. And I'm going to show you how to save even more and get a better deal than anybody else. So keep listening. We're talking 50% off products, updates, and upgrades, plus special hardware and software bundle deals. Right now, Native Instruments is offering 50% off all Complete 14 bundles, as well well as all individual instruments, effects, expansions, and upgrades. So don't miss their unbeatable hardware and software bundles, including machine and complete control keyboards. Over at Plugin Alliance, you can get more than 160 special deals on the greatest plugins, with some as low as $7.99. Just a few of my new mixing favorites are Black Box Analog Design, Townhouse Bus Compressor, Amec 9099 Console, and and metric AB for referencing my mixes. Plus, there's tons of killer free plugins just to get you started. And finally, at Isotope, you can get classic tools like RX, Ozone, and Neutron for 50% off. Plus, here's a secret for you. Use the code ROCK10 when you check out for an additional 10% off. So that gets you a lower price than anybody else. Plus, they're giving away their incredible audio lens plugin right now to help you dial in the perfect mix EQ curve. Just go to isotope.com slash rockstars and get ready to rock this summer. This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Isotope, Atom Audio, Jay-Z Microphones, and Spectra 1964. You're hearing my voice right now on the Jay-Z V12 microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX100D mic pre and C610 complimenter with Isotope, RX, Ozone, and Neutron all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD and mixed on Atom Audio monitors. Please remember to check out our awesome sponsors using the link in the show notes. It's a great way to help support this show. Now get ready to rock. Don't listen for what you did wrong. Listen for which take makes you excited. When you play music, you look for like magical moments and excitement and cohesion and becoming one as a group almost or something. You know, you want excitement. We shouldn't be thinking about mistakes, you know. A mix never has a mistake. A mix can be unlistenable, but it's not a mistake. It's just an idea, an iteration of what it could be. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hey, rock stars, over here. I've got a secret to tell you about how I get a consistent sound mixing over a thousand hours of recording studio rock stars. My secret is using Isotope, RX, Ozone, and Neutron on every single episode. Right now, you're hearing RX Breath Control, D Click, D Clip, D S, D Plosive, Voice Denoise, Ozone Multi Band Compression, Neutron EQ, and Limited all from Isotope. Go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the secret code ROCK10 and get 10% off any plug-in purchase from Isotope. You can tell your friends, but, you know, be cool about it. My recording studio is proudly powered by OWC, and I love how it's improved and sped up my workflow. OWC can connect all your audio work drives, trackballs, mix controllers, MIDI keyboards, audio interfaces, displays, or cameras so that you can work fast and focus on making your best record ever. Go check out the Mini Stack STX, Thunder Bay 4, or Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock at maxsales.com com slash rockstars to find the perfect solution for your studio from OWC. 
Hey, rock stars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rock Stars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Larry Crane, the founder of Tape Op Magazine, owner of Jackpot Recording Studio, a producer, engineer, mixer, and recording arts educator. He's been on the podcast previously multiple times to talk about starting out in a band, launching the magazine Tape Op, producing records and mixing and recording at Jackpot. He's also talked about recording and curating the musical archives of Elliot Smith and lots of other fun stuff. Today, I'm psyched to have Larry back, though, to catch up, see what's new in the studio, talk about various archival and restoration projects and get more recording and mixing insights for you. Please welcome Larry Crane back to Recording Studio Rockstars. Larry, my friend, are you ready to rock yet again? You know, I am so ready to rock. I I can believe it, man. Yeah, yeah. I can believe it. And as we recall, when you historically rocked, you had the the, um, guitar with not enough strings on it in your hands, right? When was I doing that? Oh, well, the bass? Didn't it oh, when I played like, bass? Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's play not bass. a guitar. It's a... <laughs> I think by now you'd know that's called the bass, but hey, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, that's what I was rocking with. But but really, I kind of started as a guitar player, uh, you know, and, and a weird kind of electronic noise-making person, I think. Oh, yeah? You know. Yeah, well, we, I'm yeah. sure we talked about that stuff, like uh, recording yeah, cassette to yeah. cassette and all that oh, kind of yeah. stuff. I did all that. Do you yeah. um do you let yourself play a lot of instruments and a lot of music still, or do you find that that's something that kind of you know our our balance of recording and producing mm-hmm. to playing changes as we do this for a while? I mean, I think I would play music more, and I would probably play on more people's records if I was a much more adept musician. And I don't say that in a disparaging way towards myself. I don't I don't have any regrets about my abilities as a musician but I'm just not the person who sat and practiced. I'm not that kind of person. You know, I did never tried to be, I got to be a very adept bass player at the style I was doing like in the vomit launch years. Yeah. And I was, I was quick and I was nimble and I could play these certain kind of busy little lines that we had. Um, and I had a certain style that was all stolen from Peter hook from joy division probably. But, um, I, you know, never got really, I still can't even play a proper bar chord. Let's put it that way on a guitar. But, I like so, quick and nimble. It sounds like Santa Claus. Quick and nimble. I could, I could, yeah, it was nimble and <laughs> that's right. By the and, way, uh, this is sort of, I, I like to, um, I point out to the rock stars that, that I record these in advance. And so yes. this often we'll talk about something that, that, um, you know, it's coming out later, the podcast. But what's funny is as we were getting ready for our interview, I realized that we have one that's about to come out that hasn't come out and here we are recording a new episode. So that's like a first how, for me. <laughs> oh my God, really? That's we're that far ahead. Good. Yeah, good. we're that far ahead, man. We're rocking. Oh, that's perfect. Well, yeah. you know, well, I will, I'll never know. I never listen to my own podcast that I'm on. How could you, man? How could you? You know, I don't even know. So I don't even know what I talked about. You're but, too um, prolific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I do, actually, I do play, I just played bass on a, part half of a song in the studio the other day because i said oh i've got this baseline idea and it was a very uh sort of studio band we put together for an artist friend of ours yeah and so the guy who was playing bass is really a guitarist actually it's warren pash who oh i know you, warren you well might know. Yeah. yeah you might know warren and so uh he was playing bass on the live tracking and then he played guitar overdubs and ca- keyboards and backing vocals That's but awesome. anyway I was like, oh, Warren, you could do a bass line like this. And he played it, but he's like, you kind of know how that's supposed to feel. Why don't you, you know, so then the the band made, or the band or the studio band and producer, et cetera, you know, handed it the bass to me and I just punched in that section. And uh, and then Warren played the other parts of the song. So that was really fun, you know, and, and it was because, it, and I knew I'd been practicing more. I have a little acoustic bass, like one of those dreadnought kind of style. Yeah. Uh, on a peg right next to my bed bed stand nightstand and those I, things are fun yeah and they're really good for practicing because that you know you have to play a little bit hard to get the volume out and and which i do and and um and it just keeps your you know keeps your chops up a little and your calluses yeah they can so. be a little if you just record it with a mic mm-hmm. i mean you you can get some low end out of it but sometimes yeah. they they don't have tons do you so what's funny is I remember the first place I ever saw or, or was introduced to a bass like that. Yeah. And it was that Yes video that came out in the 80s where oh. they were doing like an acoustic 
uh, version of a tune sitting around a fireplace at a campsite or something. Yeah, you remember, does that ring oh, a bell? It was a video for the yeah for the the big album with the uh, owner of a lonely heart. Yeah, nine hundred one two five is that what it's called? Probably. Yeah. And uh, and there was a video for Leave It maybe, and they're sitting around a campfire. You're totally right. That's yeah, and hey, awesome. it's good enough for Chris Squire. Good enough for me, man. Yeah, shout yeah. out to you, Warren Pash. Great yeah. to see you, dude. Yeah. Um, Warren played bass on a record that I produced here and recorded yeah. with Roscoe Gordon, um, mm-hmm. the old Jump Blues singer. Um, and Warren came over. Used to live down the street from me. Yeah, and, he mentioned and we that recorded record. quite a few things here. He's yeah. incredibly talented and shot a fun Christmas video at my studio when I first <laughs> opened it too. Oh yeah, he's he's a really really great guy. He's really fun to work with and and uh, and the great thing about like this this so this, this session was really interesting. It's a, it's the main artist is this guy Chris Cephalus, T S E F A L A S, and he is an artist I recorded in my home studio, like before I had jackpot. And the reason I recorded him is because the guy who was producing and playing drums and stuff on this session is John Moen, who was, who plays in drums in the Decemberist these days, and also in a band called eyelids. But John was one of the first people to come and make a record in my basement studio before I built jackpot. Oh, wow. So, and because John was making a record there, his friend who was like a manager and booking guy heard it and told Chris to come record with me because it sounded good. And so now here we are like 27 years later and, and we roped Warren in to, to help be an extra musician. And we really kind of put together sort of a house band, you know, with Chris playing rhythm guitar and singing and Warren. Now John is the one, I was reading about your history at Mm -hmm. Jackpot and, and, um, the history of pavement and reforming is the yeah. jicks. That was was that yeah. John playing drums? That was John was playing drums in the jicks. Yeah, initially it was all started with him and Stephen playing playing together. Yeah, that's great, man. It's fun, rock stars. I encourage you to go over to LarryCrane.com and there's um, or was that on Jackpot? Ja- I guess Jackpot Recording. Jackpot too. Com. Yeah, there's yeah, a lot of the history of the studio. It's really great stuff to check out. I think when we do these things right, like having a studio that that we sort of accidentally create a community around it, you know? Yeah. And you, you've probably experienced the same thing, you know, even just mentioning Warren, you know, someone who you could call in like, Hey, come do this. Or, or he'd bring work over, you know, and the best thing you can do as a studio owner is, is to become, you know, somehow part of the music scene that you want to work with in. And, and then you yeah. see that with a lot of people that do well at this. Um, at the end of the day, you've got to be recording music, if you want to make a, a a name as a producer or engineer, you've got to be recording music that you kind of believe in, or or maybe find your find yourself a way to uh, to make yourself believe in. You know, to, even if it's not the kind of music you started out really into, you you get yeah. into it later. You know, yeah, that's true. That's totally true. Yeah. I noticed that, and I've mentioned this before that I had a certain taste for music, and then I started finding out that as as an engineer you begin to appreciate the craft of making records. So mm-hmm. you get a chance to work on, you know, for me, it might've been a country record that I wouldn't have cared about at all. But then I start working on it and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. This is like, there's all this stuff that's interesting about making it well. Yeah, I think that's so important that you have yourself open to see that. And I really did start like being more of a snotty music snob, you know, and then, and then, and then and then doing different sessions and being able to find the beauty in what other people were doing and and seeing that. I mean, even even in the case of a band like Sleet or Kenny, initially I wasn't really sold on the sound of the band. Like I, I they don't have a bass, they didn't have a bass guitar player then. Um the the two vocals would overlap, which can seem confusing to you maybe. And 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 you know, there can be a, a bit of a, a piercingness sometimes to, to Corin's voice. but And then I worked with them on a few records, and I was like, oh, I totally love this. Like, I totally, right. now I'm just a fan, you know? And, and so I think it was like, it's, sometimes it's just because we haven't spent enough time, you know, we, we try to make judgments so fast, you know, about, like, what do you think of that new such and such record? Well, I, oh, I it's garbage, and you've heard like half of one song on the radio. Right, yeah. You know, I mean, and and 
and this is such a similar thing. I'm working on an end rant, which will probably be out by the time this airs, but I'm working on an idea for an end rant, which is like the basic gist is, do we have to have an opinion? Do we, do we have to, do we have to sit here and say, uh, what do you think of that, uh, 1176 reissue? And then you say, I'll tell me like, well, it's not as good as the original. It's like, he did, and, you, and you've used it once for like half an hour, you know, or right. something. It's like, no, you don't have to have an opinion, you know. We and we, we do have to have opinions down the line, but we don't have to have an instant opinion. I guess would be what I'm trying to right. say. Right? You just be like, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I, don't know. I mean, well, it's funny because you talk about the um, like experiencing a plug-in or a piece of gear or a microphone, mm-hmm. and more times than not, I can remember experiencing something from the first for the first time. But it was during a session when I only had a split second. And yeah. if it didn't work in that moment, yeah. then it gets put away. And then I was like, we just didn't like it. And then right. like I, I had that happen to Mike's. Then later I come yeah. back and I'm like, oh my God, this mic's amazing. Was I crazy? <laughs> and you probably weren't crazy. And it could have been, do you know how many times you think like someone, if someone else is working in your studio, they go, that that thing's broken. And you plug it in and check it out and right. you can't find anything wrong with it. Yeah. You know, there's so many ways that something can get a little weirdly off. And microphones, I mean, I've put the same mic up in front of three different singers and two of them I didn't like it on. And the third one was amazing. So it really is sort of a strange like, huh, okay. You know, and and taking that time, you know, spending 10 years with a microphone or a piece of equipment, it makes you have a whole different opinion than than, you know, even just like a review cycle, like having, you know, a week or a month to, to try something out and write a review of it, you know, is. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it makes, it does make creating reviews of things challenging sometimes because most reviews that are valuable to whoever's being reviewed, whether it's a new record or a new piece of gear for the studio, they kind of want it out at the beginning of of releasing the thing. Yeah. And sometimes you don't feel like you can give them an honest opinion until you, like two years later, you know? I mean, records come on all the time, you know, especially like things that were sort of underground, like in the eighties or something. And I'll be like, Oh man, I thought this record was a horrible, like record when it came out. Cause I was so excited about the record before it, you know, by this artist. And then the new record comes out and I'm like, Oh my God, they sold out. This is disgusting. And now I go back and I go, I don't even hear what I was thinking about, you know? Yeah, so yeah. it could have been like, like REM would be a great example. Like they got kind of like more beefy and glossier productions going, uh, especially the uh, the Don Gaiman record and and then Scott Litt was a lot different than the Don Dixon, Mitch Easter stuff, right? Or mm-hmm. the Joe, Joe Boyd, Tony Platt stuff. So, you know, as they went along, you could hear like the sound getting a little bigger and a little more muscular and the more reverb be kind of like in a, in a hard rock reverb kind of way even. And, um, you can think of that as being a bad thing. And then you can go back and listen to it 20, 30 years later. And you're like, I, I don't even know what I was thinking about. Like, this yeah. also, this all sounds kind of the same and it sounds like REM. Like, why was that? Why was that such an up in arms moment? You know, I feel so, like, I feel that way about all the music out of the eighties. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it would always be something that was like, oh God, they used to be so good, you know. And sometimes that was true, and sometimes somebody would be handed the wrong producer, maybe, right? You know, or or sometimes they would run out of time and money, and and have to just like finish the record in like a night, you know. So did that happen you know? for you for um, the replacements? Pleased to meet me. Oh. Huh, huh. Replacements are a great example of like m- most of the production I don't agree with. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, um, oh God. I'll, well, I was uh, just listening. I was, yeah. in a, I was picking up bagels downtown yeah. and I could barely hear over the speaker above my head. It was, um, you know, at the party somewhere down the line, that, that track. Yeah. And I was standing there. I was like, why are they playing this? I mean, it's great. I love that they're playing this, yeah. but why are they playing this? And then I also thought like, nobody else in here knows what this song is except for me. <laughs> yeah, they don't know but what also, it is. But also it was just like, all you could hear was just the snare and just oh, a, yeah. the tiniest bit of something else behind it. Yeah, it so a, vo- a, vocal, a vocal drenched in reverb. I yeah. mean, I I heard when we were working on that session, I just told you about um, the artist brought in some stuff that was probably like, 89 to 91 92 that he had done with a producer back then and it was so 
digital reverbed out. I mean, it was yeah. so like everything was just drenched in sort of a big murky cloud of reverb. And I love reverb. I will slather reverb all over a record, but I'm so specific, you know, with plate reverbs and tape delays and certain things that I really think work. And I, I tailor them with EQ and I compress them and I DS them and I do all this shit, you know, and I'm listening to this, this production. I'm like, this is horrible. Like this needs a remix, but you know, we don't have the multis. Um, but you know, it's like, it's just stuck in a time. It's like, and he's like, can we fit this onto this record we're working on? I'm like, we can't because it won't, <laughs> it'll never sound. We can't mix the other stuff to sound like that. Because that'd be a travesty, and we can't unmix what happened here. I'm glad you used the word travesty. It's been a travesty. while since that word's been on the podcast. It's a good That's one. That's good. That's good, yeah. I get upset about the sound of things, you know? Yeah. The Jay-Z Microphone Vintage Series are built by hand in Latvia, featuring the patented Golden Drop Capsule design for enhanced clarity that will give your recordings the classic vintage tone. Our friends at Jay-Z Microphones have also come up with a special offer only available to recording studio Rockstars listeners. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTAR to get 40% off the V67, V47, or V12 microphones. And to make this deal, even better, they'll throw in a free shock mount worth $120 for a limited time at jzmike.com. Adam Audio can provide all your monitor needs. Whether you are setting up a first-time home studio for recording music or podcasts, or a world-class full-size studio for professional mixing and mastering in stereo or immersive sound. Featuring the XART tweeter and custom DSP onboard processing, the new A-Series monitors will perfectly adapt to your studio. Get the Atom Audio monitors and subwoofers that are right for you with an extended five year warranty at adamaudio.com on a yep. random other topic yeah. question um because we were chatting about it beforehand somehow it came up oh i know what it was it was something to do with candles yes um what does uh what does recording in the studio smell like to you your, your memory <laughs> your memory of being in the studio well if the drummer's too sweaty it's awful but um <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm not sure i asked the question right but you know what i mean yeah. well you know um we were talking earlier about this this the smell of analog tape and anyone that's listening right now that's spent an inordinate amount of time you know in a room with a tape deck running would know exactly what we're talking about yeah, but but the crazy thing is, and especially when you put that you mentioned earlier that you put the reel up and rewind it, you know, to start because you you of course store them tails out right, yeah. and you rewind it to start your session so you can start at the top of the head and um, you'd smell the tape. You just smell yeah. it's going it's whisk whipping by pretty fast on the on the transport and you'd smell this certain smell and, and then you quote you'd quote apocalypse now yeah, yeah I, love, I love the smell of analog tape in the morning there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you'd you'd smell this thing and and you know most of the people in the room the musicians weren't around that smell all the time so certainly it would jar them a little but um you know or if they even yeah if they noticed you know and but for us it'd always be like mm, i think that's some uh scotch 996 you know like you could kind of tell you could start to tell the formula because they all smelled different and the, and yeah, the engineers I, I, don't, I never got that good at it I, I don't know that i would identify them in a blind smell test you know <laughs> uh now but back then i could definitely tell because i had like used reels i would get from this guy in la and and the 996 and they'd smell a certain way but it was kind of similar to gp9 because i think that's a similar formula or mm -hmm. something and then um god yeah there were all these uh the the four four five six had a had a different like softer smell but then 499 had kind of a sharp acrid smell yeah this is i, yeah. I this has got to happen some Someday get like you and Steve Albini and and I don't yeah. know who else out there and just line them up, do the ultimate, you know, NAM panel or wherever, you know, and it's everybody's blindfolded doing oh, yeah. analog tape smell tests. I mean, I 
I've got three tape decks in my control room and I haven't turned any of them on in like at least nine months, you know, I think. And so it's, it's, it's fading, you know, that, that kind of smell memory is yeah. fading a little bit, but well, it, it was a certain thing. And there was also, <laughs> um, my studio is different now. It got remodeled. It's all sort of new and spaceshipy now, but for a long time, it was, you know, the old MCI console, the tape machines over to one side, the old racks of gear. And there was definitely a thing, and I noticed it at the studio I started out at, too, where you'd walk in, and this the whole control room has this old, it's like you smell the old oils and the capacitors mm -hmm. and things like that. It's this old electronic smell that's really yeah. comforting. Yes. Yeah, especially a place with a lot of tube gear, because the tube gear gets pretty hot. Uh, my console, I got a Rupert Neve Designs 5088. That gets incredibly hot, and components really? components break down and and stuff occasionally. Um, you know, just because of the heat. You know, uh, it, it's like it's warm. You're sitting there, and you're like, you, you start to kind of have a little sweat. Yeah, it's an film, oven. You know? Yeah, it's pretty warm. And I, I I convinced a friend to buy one. who lives down in Florida, and he's like, "You didn't warn me that it was so hot. I live in Florida." You know, I'm like, "Oh, he had to redo yeah. his AC." You know. Um, but it yep. is a great sounding console. Yeah. But yeah, no but yeah, I mean, all that gear, yeah, it does. There's a certain smell. My, I feel like my studio doesn't really quite do that now for some reason. I have really good ventilation. And a lot of times I might be not turning the console on if I'm tracking straight into Pro Tools and I'm going to mix it through the console. Or um, the tape decks aren't on. You don't have the, the oil from the capstan motors and, and stuff like that and that smell the tape smell and uh and even if i'm if i'm doing a lot of work in the box or something i'll turn all the tube gear off because it's you know it's you're just wasting it's it's tube life but uh it it does seem more neutral than some because i remember other studios like if you go to we, we mentioned mentioned uh welcome to 1979 yeah you go to that control room it has a certain smell like kind of like that because there's a lot of good old school gear yeah, it's and like stuff. old good wood and things like yeah that. there's all that wood too yeah yeah that gives final it kind records of on the shelf tape yeah. reels <laughs> motorcycle maybe in the yeah. control room was there a motorcycle in the control room one time i, I think there almost always is or yeah there was think, for a long period yeah yeah i didn't ride around the room in it but <laughs> on it but <laughs> yeah I didn't do that <laughs> well that's good stuff you know when you talk about a hot console my mci board was like having an oven in there, you know, at mm -hmm. times. And we had to massively oversize the air conditioner to accommodate it. And to be honest, now that I don't have it, now it feels sometimes like the air conditioner is too oversized. So, <laughs> and it's one of those MIDI split units. So that's something you yeah, got to deal yeah. with rock stars is, you know, when it comes to AC or, or uh, probably not heat, but when it comes to AC, you may have to over-engineer your control room because of all the gear that's in there. I I think the ult, well the ultimate is is what Steve Albini did with uh with electrical audio where he has a cooling system that comes in from under underneath and into the racks behind the gear so the ra the racks are built into the walls and stuff and then airflow comes up and down around in the back of those racks keeping the gear at a nice temperature yeah so, so the only things you're having to cool in the room at that point are the would be the console. I mean, like yeah. console power supply is being cooled separately. You know, your tape decks or your console would would be the things generating heat. And you Plus can his is a double. Uh, his the the there it's ported around the edges of the floor. It goes all the way down into the basement, so the yeah, rooms are actually exactly. much bigger. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a really good system. That's a really brilliant way to do it. I think Bob Weston helped with some of that design too. Yeah. yeah. Um. You know, but uh, God, I mean, I wish. If I had my ultimate studio design, the control room would be completely independent of the other rooms, you know, uh, as far as heating and cooling, because almost always you're just cooling the control room, you know? Yeah, exactly. You said that's kind of one of the problems. And and then you're, like in our studio, especially right now, the, lo the lobby, the entranceway is freezing. So you got to heat the bejesus out of that. You walk into this little kitchenette and, uh, and bathroom area which stays kind of neutral. And then you're in the control room, which always gets generally too hot. And then you go into the live room, which is kind of half buried into the hill a little bit. And that stays 
kind of mellow you know it, it'll cool get kind of cool but it won't get freezing like the front room when it's cold out like today so it's this weird like we're trying to heat this room cool this room we keep that room stable and we have like a special hvac with the uh built-in little shutters or whatever like valves yeah, on yeah, it or something yeah. and the, it'll it'll gate it and do this and it'll go back and forth between heating and cooling it's just it just seems kind of crazy. But Sometimes could, I think you could, if you've got spaces like that, like my studio yeah. has a loft area, which was always be too hot. Yeah. And then the downstairs that you wanted the heat or you wanted the cool upstairs. I was like, mm-hmm. why can't we just have like tubes that just kind of carry the air from one space mm-hmm. to another? If you, <laughs> that's, if you can keep them soundproofed, you know, it might oh, be a totally. clever way to do it. I mean, one of the things I do is, is when I'm in sessions, I'm like, keep all the doors open. You know, like if we're mixing don't close the door to the live room and don't close the door to the lobby area. Like just leave them all open and the heat will kind of just the, the cold and hot air will kind of blend. And we don't, and we have more, we have more fresh air in the control room that way. But yeah. people always have this weird tendency in the studio to shut doors. You ever notice that they'll shut doors at all the time when they don't need to. I, I think so. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's funny now in my control room, I've got one of those Carl Tatz systems in there with mm. his speakers and when he was going to shoot it out, he asked me at the last minute, he's like, do you want the doors open or closed? And I was like, oh, you know? Yeah. So we, I was like, right? well, I guess I want it closed because if I'm sound checking a kick drum, I want to, I want the doors closed so that I don't hear the drums coming through. So yeah. now when I get to that point of like, if I'm really going to listen to the low end, I have to close all the doors and it feels a little oh, yeah. weird because I usually have it, like you said, I usually have it open right. to the kitchen and the live room and everything. I like, I like, I like... How would I put this? That's funny. You know, Craig Alvin came to my studio years ago one time. We were because he's like we're like brothers practically, and he he came in and I was sitting there. And I said, "You know, we and we built the new studio, the fifteen year old space." Um, I said, "You know, it's so different if you close that door to the live room, which is like when you're sitting at the console. It's it's to your left is the door that kind of goes past you into the live room, and it's all it's all equidistant and symmetrical." And I go, man, it's so weird because when you're mixing or something, if you close that door, it actually does sound more focused in the center spot. But yeah, I want that door open. He goes, yep, that's so typical, you know. And but the thing that I really, I don't like being in the dreary, sunless box, and that's yeah. what my studio can be if you do close all the doors and stuff. And I really, I I don't like feeling. I've got a little bit of a claustrophobia thing. I don't like feeling that. And I do like, we have sunlight coming in from the front lounge area, which isn't that far from the control room. And when those doors are all open to that, then you kind of see the light flicker when the bus goes by and you, and you just get a little bit of some environment coming back at you. And I really much prefer to work with that, that, you know, even if there's noise, I don't care. It's a transitory noise. It's not messing me up, you know? And, and plus, don't our mixes have to survive the real world? Right, you know? exactly, exactly. Like, if you can't hear the mix uh, over the sound of stuff going on in the background, then the mix yeah. probably isn't right. Yeah, totally. I mean, I don't, I listen like, I don't listen like in a weird, sterile, you know, scientist kind of way. I listen in a very, you know, open, like, like how's this going to survive kind of way, you know? So you want to, yeah. you know, you want a strong, strong mix, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let's see here. Tell yeah. us um, some of the stuff that you've been working on this past year. I mean, we we spoke, uh, I don't know, maybe a year ago or something. And I don't know if there's been any major changes for you in the studio setup, but um, you've probably been working on some cool projects. Yeah, man. Um, things that came out, like probably before we even talked last time, I had tracked most of the instrumental basics for a She and Him record. Um, call it's called it's out now. It's called Melt Away. The songs of Brian Wilson, and yeah, uh, and, it's awesome. Yeah, and that was really fun. Um, uh, and I think Tom Schick mixed that over at uh, the Loft, Jeff Tweedy's Wilco Studio, and um, and and the vocals. Uh, I tracked most all of Matt's vocals, and then um, uh, Zoe Deschanel's vocals were done by Pierre De Reader down in L.A. Uh, who's who's awesome has a wonderful studio down there yeah he's great he's been on the yeah. uh, podcast as oh well. cool he's such he's like the nicest guy there's no doubt about it <laughs> and uh and he did a great job everyone did a great job and it's a really cool beautiful record 
Um, and uh, I was happy to be a part of that, but it took a while <laughs> to come out. But uh, I worked on a, a record, um, um, a band called Federale here in town. That came out a little while ago, and that's like uh, sort of spaghetti western type music. Yeah. This is all covers, yeah. Yeah, I wrote spaghetti western cowboy choral music. Yeah. I mean, there's a cover of uh, Sundown, Sundown, uh, I think, by... Uh, by um nancy sinatra and lee hazelwood which is just it's just i've been a huge fan of that that music for years so trying to replicate it like the string we had a hired a guy remotely who did all the string parts and uh it was such a massive i mean some of these songs must have been 150 tracks because we're just the guys overdubbing strings one at a time you know and but but then Colin Hegna, who's kind of the leader of the band, the singer, he's also a producer, producer, engineer, and writes music for film and and all that kind of stuff too. So he would like submix some of the strings. You know, it was a kind of a cool collaboration. And some of the songs, one of the songs he just did his own mix of, and I tracked and produced it. And then another song was a whole different session I wasn't even on. But um, yeah, it was so he really would, cool. he would submix the strings for you. You didn't have to deal with hundred strings. Yeah, I think we would end up just having you know like sort of like more like sections, you know, or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. Because that's that. There's times you know in mixing, I do so much mixing. I mean, I'm mixing is something I'm probably doing every week, you know, on a number of different projects. And you know, I just I keep trying to figure out how to write because you know my, the way I can voice uh, get my thoughts out there are the tape op end rants, right? And I and and I keep trying to subtly tell people, like, focus, focus, focus. God damn it, fucking focus. Because it's like, you know, when you get sent something to mix and it's like hundreds, a hundred tracks or something, there can be times where that is fine. It totally makes sense that it was prepared that way. It had to only exist in that way. And there are other times where you're like, all those little bits and bobs could just be one stereo track. Like right. that wouldn't change anything. In fact, if I undo that mix and then put it back together, it's just going to create a whole bunch of problems because now, you know, oh, the third glockenspiel hit on the 12th chorus. Uh, it needs to be panned left to right, not right to left. You know, like there's some, there's something that you lose that somehow is important, <clears throat> maybe. And, uh, right. <laughs> and you know, and you're just fighting it. Then you're fighting this thing of, of tearing apart and rebuilding. And, uh, I, it was something like the the Federale work. It was great because he's an experienced producer, mixer, engineer, and an arranger. And so he knew what was going to make sense on some of these yeah. things. You know, like here's a bunch of dry strings, stereo tracks, and then add your plate reverb to it. You know, that kind of thing. Hey, rock stars, are you recording your own music or other people's music in your studio, but you're having trouble getting your mixes to sound great? Do they sound kind of weak or distant or lack punch or clarity? Well, I've got a gift to help you take your mixes from sounding like basement demos to sounding a lot closer to professional mixes. And it's my free introductory course called Mix Master Bundle. This course shows you how to get pro sound with your mixes from your home studio using free plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these fundamental mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you're in Logic, Cubase, PreSonus, Studio One, Reaper, or whatever you're using. If you're ready to make your best record ever, then go to MixMasterBundle.com and get started now for free. And you can find the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. What are you finding as far as a smart way to submix things, submix things down in Pro Tools now when you're going into the mix process. For example, um, I don't remember, I think we had folder tracks last time we chatted, but that's a yeah, you know, re- right? relatively new right. approach. Do you find that, you know, doing the commit feature for folder tracks is a smart way to do that where you could un- make a change later if you had to, but, but I do, move I forward? Do, I do a majority of the mixing I do currently is in the box, although a lot of it has been console mixes, which are you know, a certain upcharge, you know, um, just because it just always blocks out your day whole, a whole different way, right, you know, right, less yeah. flexibility. But the console, the the in-the-box mixes frequently, I don't commit anything. Um, one of the few things I will commit are some of the, the harder plugins like uh, 
uh, Drumagog I'll use sometimes for drum replacement. I might commit that and then time align that after I commit it because it's mm -hmm. always out of whack, <laughs> you know. And uh, the other thing will be uh, maybe uh, sometimes some of the plugins. Uh, obviously, I commit. I do all my Isotope work, Isotope RX. Yeah. Uh, outside of Pro Tools and then bring it back in. So I'm not I'm not making those kind of programs run. And some certain things I've noticed, like um, two reverbs I really like that UAD has, the um, Capital Chambers and the uh, Ocean Way Studios, whatever. Ocean, uh, those two rooms, those two sounds, they, they're they're really they're really heavy duty ones that use up a lot of processing power. And I might just. Uh, commit those you know yeah sometimes but I, overall i don't with large gangs of stuff i haven't even got into the i've seen how folders works and i've had some sessions sent to me that had it going and i'm like oh okay but i've never made my own folder in a session yet um well it's always an interesting testament yeah. to the fact that once you have something that works why do yeah. you, you don't you don't automatically have to change it just because there's an upgrade you know yeah i mean i just you know my thing is working really fast and working very intuitively, you know, because if I'm offering a $250 mix with some caveats, I have to be, you know, able to get that mix done. I figure four hours max, yeah. you know, I really yeah, can't, totally. I cannot spend much more than that. And if I start working on it and I go, this is a full day project, then I'll email the person and say, really, this is, and then usually that's because of somebody really undid their rough mix and sent me raw stuff to a level where I can't get back to their mix. Oh, right. I, did, I made I'm that saying? mistake. Yeah. We were doing a record um, and it was headed down to get mixed by Tom Lord Algae down in Miami. Mm -hmm. And we had to put it on a reel of tape because those guys were famous for that. It was like, it's got to oh, be on the yeah, Sony yeah. 24 or 48 oh. or whatever. So we yeah. went and did this whole thing, and I I just didn't know. I was just like, all right, I guess I have to undo all this stuff and put it on the individual tracks. And we get down there, and it was like we had lost our whole intro and everything. And it was like oh my. we had to recreate everything, and it was yeah, but, uh, you know, learning lesson for me for sure. Yeah, I mean, sometimes if something's working, then you just print it and hold it. Yeah, I just mean, commit it. I mean, when I'm tracking, when I'm producing and tracking, or co-producing and tracking, like I probably was recently you know, things get committed in tracking, you know, like I get drum sounds up with, without using much EQ at all, like the tiniest amount of EQ, a little tiny bit of compression limiting, and then maybe the room mics are smashed, you know, but I change the mics out, I change the drum sounds, I fix everything on the drums, and then that gets tracked. But then like multi mics on guitar amps, they get blended down on the console bus. Mm -hmm. Like those are, those are single mono tracks. Yeah. So we we get those phase uh, relationships committed at that stage instead of having some horrible Pro Tools is definitely not phase phase coherent. You know, I don't. I have so many situations where I've tr multi tracked guitar apps and it sounds ten times worse the next day playing it back in Pro Tools because it just it doesn't. In my opinion, it does not hold phase. You yeah. know, it's like a moving target, you know. Yeah, it's keep it has to recalculate everything. Yeah, there's something wrong. And I Well, I, swear. I mean, just by the fact that, you know, when you're in the land of computer, you 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 pull up a session on a Monday and you come back into working on a Tuesday and you're like, but this just worked on Monday and it's not yeah. working today. Yeah. So obviously sound, things are changing. It would sound better going down and then it would sound worse, you know, on playback. So I started I've noticed I've noticed yeah. that there was uh I, I felt like I was hearing a difference between Pro Tools and input versus Pro Tools mm -hmm. playing back the audio later. Right. And another one um, that's very subtle but worth checking out is um, there's a difference, too, between, like, let's say you have uh, a couple of tracks edited together and then you duplicate the audio. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be identical one-to-one. -one, yeah. But if you duplicate it and you go in and out, undo, redo, so that you hear the difference, you'll notice that the high end changes, the, the, really? the top changes. Yeah. Jesus Christ. And it has, it has for yeah. decades. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'll do null tests and things sometimes just to confirm and you'll hear weird little differences. Like, now in all fairness, rock stars, yeah. we're, we're talking about pro tools cause that's the one we're using yeah. all every day. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if the same experiences happen on all the DAWs, you know, I certainly have 
you know, gone to use logic, loved it, been like, wow, this yeah. is so great. And then I'm like, but why is it so buggy and not working and doing? Why is and the this, click track not playing when it's supposed to be playing? Things like right. that. Right. And I, this phase stuff I'm talking about is, in my mind, really hard to detect. I mean, it's just something I've noticed over and over, like something was thwarting me at the mix stage, you know, and I'm not using garbage stuff. I'm using Burl converters and motherships. I've got a couple, you know. Uh, I've just had so many problems with that. So I try to commit like anything, all these things down. Obviously, the drums are on separate tracks, but then I'll use uh, Sound Radix, Auto Align, yeah. you know, at the mixing stage to double reinforce things and i'll keep flipping polarity on everything and i just i get really really you know so you dig you find the the phase and um, timing alignment tools to be really useful with drums yeah i use i use that and i use uh ibp little labs ibp sometimes yeah yeah. the the real one and the the plug-in and then uh and you know i just do a lot of checking i don't really rely much on like zooming in on waveforms and that stuff because that's that's just a uh, I've I've noticed that just ends up feeling really amateur hour if you're trying to nudge tracks by visually seeing where they're at. It doesn't really mm. work, I don't think. You like using your ear. Yeah, you have to use your ear. I mean, I think yeah. you can see, like, you can look, you'll be like, I think the snare's out of phase of the overheads, and you can zoom in and see that that's true. But as far as, and maybe you can flip that 180 degrees, and then you're in a better spot. Mm-hmm. But those micro relationships of phase are just really like they can be deal breakers. They can just destroy, you know, what you're doing. And, and, and really, you know, I've, I've known this for like 30 some odd years and it's still just like fighting it on a day-to-day basis. You know, it's just, yeah. this, there never seems to be an absolute, you know, it's like this things that change during the course of a song even, you know? Well, it's just a good reminder that committing stuff down to a single audio track, at least that's, many steps in the right direction yeah. rather than leaving a bunch of things sort of and if it's done requiring right, you know? high math to recreate every time you hit the play button. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so too. And I think if, you know, if there's stuff that you, if say you're an artist and you've got a certain, a decent enough level, skill level built up to record yourself a clean vocal and, and decent guitar and whatever tracks you're trying to track, you know, um, say you're doing that, and you're sending it off to someone like you or me to mix, you know, if there's really special effect things that have to happen, and I tell people this a lot, I'm like, if you want something to pan left and right, print me a stereo track of that that pans left and right. It'll do exactly what you want. But don't send me a track and say, I've already done all the fades, you know, the fade at the end of the song. Like, that that just puts me in a corner where I can't get back out of, you know? And don't commit to things that are stupid. Just send me a rough mix and say, this is how it fades, and it starts around you know, 345, you know. Um, But, you know, there are so many things that could be, you know, I I get a lot of like sort of amateur productions, not trying to say this disparagingly because I love and appreciate the work, but it's where they just keep adding more and more tracks to something because they're like, oh, if I had another level of, you know, electronic pad and then I'll double and triple and quadruple that little pattern with this instrument, like if that's really like you've got a balance that makes sense and that's a little part in the song that just plays like four or five notes, just just print that as one stereo tr- stem and and send me that and say, here's a folder with all the stuff separated, but this is how I want it balanced. Yeah. And that that saves a thousand hours, man. It's like, you know, because if you're going to go in there and go, I wanted the pad a little louder at the end of the section and at the beginning, I want the glockenspiel sound higher and then I want the the electric roads to take over and then I want it to, you know, it's like, Jesus fucking Christ. Like, <laughs> I'm not a mind reader and I can't hear that in a rough mix, you know? Yeah, yeah. You could just, just hear the part. Just commit with automation, right? Because if got, even, yeah. even, if it, even if the volume of that track is going up or down for you at the mix, yeah. You can still adjust it up or down a little bit more, but at least you're in that general yeah. intended I mean, I don't, ballpark, right? I don't mind if someone commits an automation thing and, and and prints it that way. I don't want to get a session with automation built in because that's another corner you get jammed into. Right. You know, I I, I wipe out. I look at the the automation and I might mute some parts in a track, you know, clip game things, whatever, and then wipe out all the automation because especially mixing on the console and mixing in the box to me, it just, all of a sudden you're dealing with these moving 
levels that you have no control over and it just right. usually ends up being stupid you know yeah so in other words rock stars if i hear you right larry you're saying yeah. Don't deliver a session with the automation lines, you know, yeah. breakpoints embedded into the track. But but if you if you were to bounce that track through the automation down to a, a stereo audio track that, that has that volume fluctuations, if it's very appropriate, if that might sense, be okay. That might work really well. Um, I mean, most of the time when I look at automation that people are drawing, drawing or whatever they're doing, most of the time it really doesn't do it isn't even really effective it's not even right. really little teeny things doing it's like things i'll see automation where there's no audio clip there's no there's no way for right it. right and i'm like well that must be <laughs> left over from when there was something else on there but you know but one of the things that when i'm mixing i don't generally do a single bit of automation and um one of the things i do is just chop the tracks up i break them up Here's a track, and here's a track, and here's a track, and here's a track, and all these different things can happen at different times in the song, and uh, and so so and, a guitar might be on one track for the verse, but yeah. cut down to on another track with a different processing, a different level for the chorus. So what I'll do is is like I might get sent like a single guitar that goes all through the song, and and I'll set up a basic sound. I might put a little bit of compression and EQ and stuff on it, and then I'll duplicate uh, an empty track below you know maybe three of them and then just start chopping it up and placing it for different parts of the song like you're kind of saying so uh, and i don't just do that on a road i'll make sure that i need to do that you know because right. there might not be any reason to but i'll you know that one thing that'll do is like someone will hear the song and go you know the guitar and the chorus could just be louder and i can just all i do is turn up a fader right and then the whole all the choruses have louder guitar i don't have to it's go a lot there. easier than going in and trimming yeah, clip all gaining spots. all these things or something. It's you know, make make it easy on yourself and set up systems that that that'll work really fast, you know. Well, especially because in Pro Tools, if you had done an automation line mm. across the first chorus and the automation goes up one dB and then there's a break point at the beginning of the chorus, <laughs> but it's one point one dB at the end of the chorus, yeah, now the yeah. trim tool won't work. Yeah, and it starts yeah. doing like funny yeah. triangles instead of just lifting the whole thing. Yeah, the whole, I mean, automation on consoles was 90% of the time just grueling and awful, if you remember. And and I would always end up just going, you know what, I'm going to use my fucking hands. I'm going to shut off this automation thing. You know, one time I, I set up a whole mix in the studio. I gave up on the automation, set up a whole mix. The guy came in at night, turned off the console, turned it back on in the morning, and then all my faders went, you know, to like Unity or something. Oh, my God. And I was just like, I quit. I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm not going to work at this place. If you guys don't know that happens, I don't want to, I don't know what else is wrong. You know, so I, I just, I'm really, I love having all the visuals I need. I'm looking at my Pro Tools recording us right now. I love having all the visuals I need to see the music as if it's sort of like sheet music, you know, yeah. sort of broken up into things. It's all doing its parts. And I don't like having hidden stuff like, like things in the folders or, or hidden automation or mute auto, volume or mute or panning automation. If I do something like a panning automation, it's in one little spot. Okay. I know that's there. Fine. I'm done with that, you know, but in general, I want everything to be just very much right in front of me, right on this, on the uh, edit screen and and ready to go because that's that's what i'm looking at is like what happens when as this song moves along you know so that's that's really important owc is your one-stop shop for flexible drive storage and connectivity solutions for your studio the mini stack stx for your mac mini adds two additional drives over a universal sata hdd ssd bay and an nvme m.2 pcie ssd slot plus three additional thunderbolt usb-c ports or the owc thunder bay 4 chassis built like a tank gives you four hot swappable two and a half inch raid configurable drive bays, plus an extra Thunderbolt 3 jack for daisy chaining up to five devices. Or check out the OWC Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock with two RAID configurable drives and seven ports of connectivity, including a front side SD card reader, one gig ethernet, two USB 3.2 ports, and a dedicated display port, plus an additional backward compatible Thunderbolt port. Get your studio connected with the Mini Stack STX Thunderbolt Bay 
4 and Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Use the custom link in our show notes because it's a great way for you to help support this podcast. So thanks, Rockstars. Attention, all rock stars. Isotope has got you covered. With RX, Ozone, Neoverb, Nectar, and Vocal Synth, you'll have a collection of powerful apps and plugins that will help you get a professional sound in no time. Whether you're looking to clean up your vocal recordings with RX, master your tracks with Ozone, or add depth and ambience to your mixes with Neoverb, Isotope is your magic wand for awesomeness. Plus, with Nectar and Vocal Vocal synth, you can easily add creative effects and unique textures to your vocals and instruments, from subtle mix enhancements to extreme sound design. Isotope takes your music and podcasts to the next level. Go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any plugin purchase. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session, aka the second half of the show. My guest today is Larry Crane joining us from, are you in Jackpot right now? No, no you're I'm home. in my home uh, office. Yeah. Right. And I have a Pro Tools rig and and uh, uh, a D-Box, a, a, a dangerous D-Box and a bunch of stuff here. Yeah. Do you still have a, a shelf of cassettes? Yeah, right there, right, right behind me. All right. Cassettes. There's even like a Elliott Smith reel down there on the floor. That I'm supposed to put in the vault. I got to get my, my my act together. Get your vaults. Um, do you yeah. have to put on vault shoes or anything like that? Or I have to call Iron Mountain <laughs> and get them to <laughs> deliver the boxes. That's that's how I vault it. Nice yeah. man. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we did a session recently where I was playing music with my friend, old old bandmates in the studio, and the singer Chris showed up, and he had a whole stack of cassettes. They came from another uh, friend and guest on the podcast, Joe Arman. When we were in college in the 90s, he had done, he had gotten bands to do a compilation album of Schoolhouse Rock songs. It was called St. Louis Schoolhouse. Wow. And Joe walks in with a whole stack of these still like shrink wrapped, beautiful looking cassettes. Wow. And I was just like, God, that's so great to see. I mean, I don't have any way to, I don't think I have a cassette player here in, at home at all nowhere not the car my car is at least new enough to have a broken cd player and uh i don't have any way to play them and, and the only way I, I think i can play them is to go to the studio and get my four track cassette recorder out which which yeah. actually it actually plays cassettes very very well it's and you got speed control and it's pretty yeah, cool didn't it usually do normal cassette speed or double speed right mine was a normal speed but it, it was a uh it's a yamaha mt1x I think it, I had one of those. Yeah, and it's black and and it's 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 got DBX and it works. The noise reduction actually works really really well. Could you punch kinda, in on it? Uh, you know, I don't think I understood what that was back then, so I'm not sure <laughs> that I ever did. <laughs> I I don't. Yeah, yeah I think I, mine was like that too. Where I was like, I don't wait a minute, you, you can't punch in. Some of them you could. I don't think you could. I don't remember being able to do that. Like, how you would you to do play that? it from top to bottom? Yeah, I mean, take? I just. I just, yeah, that's how I did everything back then. I would just track it and then track again and then track when I messed up, do it again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I never thought about that. Speaking that, of cassettes, yeah. um, Colin Dupuy, I just did an interview with him, and he yeah. brought up a great plug-in again that I just finally went and got. Um, it's by Aberrant DSP, and it's called the Sketch Cassette 2. Oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, man, this thing is so cool. It's really cool. Um, I used that on a, on a mix just the other day. It was something that was just, I can, I, you know, we were talking earlier about mixing and kind of the back and forth rapport that you have. And, and what, what do you hear? You hear the rough mix and you go, okay, cool. And, and, uh, and then you, you're trying to rem do it, trying to mimic it in a way. And you're like, well, this vocal's way more hi fi than the rough mix. You know, and that happens a lot where someone's done what whatever. I have no idea processing, and you're trying to mimic it. Sketch cassette's been a good one to just kind of, kind of lo-fi something, but keep it interesting sounding. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, the funny thing about going digital and and Pro Tools and all the stuff that we have is, it 
you did, I always think about going to the art museum and then you see somebody who you look at this, you know, work of art and it's like, it's like, oh, the whole thing is just like five shades of white mm-hmm. and that's it or yeah. something. Yeah. And, and, and then on the other end is like, you know, you know, completely complete realism, or it's like maybe realism that maybe you even find boring sometimes, you know, if you're into the abstract, but it, with recording, it's like that too. It's like, there's no reason why all the sounds that we're getting all have to be complete realism. No, no. And they, I mean, there's, I go back and forth on this because there is something amazing about very clearly recorded uh, voices and instruments. Like there's a, a level of, of sonic detail that can reinforce like emotional connections. But then there's something where you hear something so raw, it feels so, there's so much authenticity somehow to this capturing of this performance that you're like, that's a real thing. That's a real thing, you know? And that could be like a boom box in a corner or something, you know, just like somehow it just feels more like a real capturing of a performance. And, and so in between there is, is all the good music. So like, you know, you have to think about that. And we're, you know, I've been working on re not, I'm not a mastering engineer, although people send me work all the time and ask me and I don't do it. I send it to other people. Uh, but I do a lot of work. Like we've talked before on the show about Elliot Smith and supervising his, um, archives, audio archives. Uh, I do a lot of work for other people doing like what I call kind of like restoration and, and mix prep or, you know, prepping mixes or, or prepping two tracks for mastering to be done. And, and that's kind of how I approach like, uh, the either or and self-titled albums of Elliot Smith's that I've yeah. remastered. Um, I went and, and got already. And then I went and worked with Adam Consolves at Telegraph Audio and we, we mastered, I sat in and we remastered all the stuff for the album. But the work I did before that was like removing clicks and removing hiss and, and, uh, you know, just fixing elements of, of the original mix that, that, you know, were rough. They were just, if you listen to especially Elliot Smith's uh, Roman Candle album, which I also did the same work on, which is first record, it's four track cassette, like we're talking about. And so there's an, an, an there's a lot of tape hiss. There's a lot of weird sibilance, and there's a lot of guitar squeaks, like acoustic guitar, squeak, 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 and the chord changes. Yeah. And and so a lot of those I would attenuate and kind of like make them sound softer, so they're not jutting out in the middle of a word, and stuff like that. So I do a lot of that kind of work, but the whole time I'm going, am I ruining the the intimacy of this? Am I ruining the authenticity of this? Am I Am I ruining, am I, am I destroying something? And there's gonna be fans on Reddit just tearing me apart tomorrow, you know, or whatever. Well, that will always happen no matter what we do. (laughs) Apparently I've seen stuff and I'm like, wow, that person doesn't know what they're talking about, but whatever. I was there. You weren't fuck off, (laughs) but but, we went through that too. So when I, when I remastered, um, for a digital release, our earliest record, which was 30 songs to cassette from 1990, (laughs) you know, I, I was you know, feeling the same way. It's like, I want to make it better, not worse. Right. Right. Or, or, and if you don't want to make it better, then I guess just don't do anything. But, but, uh, you know, we were up against that too, where the guitar player, I did all the work and then, um, Johnny listened and he was like, I kind of missed the, you know, the messed upness of the cassette version. Mm -hmm. Like something was lost with the mid range. And it's like, and I had to think like, all right, let's, let's, let's like, you know, as, (laughs) It's my girlfriend, yeah. Chrissy, was joking about yeah. this. Let's put on our big boy pants <laughs> and, like, take a good close look at this. Let's decide. Is yeah, it yeah. better or worse, you know? Yeah. And I think in the end, we decided that that it was an improvement and it was good. Yeah. But it's a very real question. I I, I ask myself several factors. And, I, and I'm in the middle of, of reworking Jolie Holland's Catalpa album. It's her first release on anti- records i think it'll be on on an independent label after this or something and and this is a reworked version of it and um jolie and i've worked on proper studio albums a few times and stuff I really adore working with her i've even shared the stage with her briefly <laughs> and uh she this record was kind of recorded as demos you know like some sort of maybe cassette or something demos uh with real you know pretty primitive and uh 
very much like you are there, you know, kind of things. And, you know, I, we talked on the phone. I'm like, what do you, you know, what, how do I approach this? Like this album has a sound. It does these things. I don't know what to say, where to start. And she goes, keep the vocals, you know, focused on the vocals. And so then I went back and listened to stuff. I'm like, oh my God, there's parts. The first song in the album is actually was turned out to be the hardest to work on. Has a spot where like third verse or something, vocals are just like 10 dB quieter. <laughs> I don't know why. You know, I think Sketch Cassette has a has a feature that'll do that called just, dropouts, you know. Just dropouts, <laughs> yeah. It's like boom, it's just quieter. And it's like it's something to do with how the, you know close she was to the mic or how somebody right. mixed it or some random thing. And so, you know, I had to find ways to bring out that section of the vocals over the existing two track mix. Plus, there were things out of phase left and right, yet the center was okay. So I had to kind of deconstruct it and put it back together. Did you try um, isotope rebalance for something like that where you can? Uh huh. Yeah, lift absolutely. The vocal? I, for that, I did that. I, I rebalanced that section. I just extracted the vocal, and then I overlay it on the existing track, and then and then bring it up and you know compress it. Uh, watch out for the top and the bottom frequencies. I EQ it them out, make it a little more mid rangey kind of. Yeah, and then and then just bring it into the mix and tweak it just subtly until it just starts to fill it back in. And uh, I did this on a on an Ian Matthews uh, cassette. There was a front of house tape from '78 in Japan. Wow! And and the same thing. It was like the vocals are just like you could listen to the tape and go, "That's pretty good." Yeah, I mean, I hear everything happening on stage there. It's a good, it's a really good board tape. I was the the board the front house engineer brought the tapes to me, and and Ian wants to maybe put them out as fan releases, kind of, you know. What, what uh, were you doing in '78? Watching Saturday morning cartoons. Seventy eight. I was fifteen. So I oh, you fifteen? Yeah, right. yeah, I was fifteen. Yeah, I was. I was just about to buy the wall and freak myself out. <laughs> you, look, you look so young, man. You you're older than me, but you look so young. Yeah, you know, it's a the healthy you're wearing living. it well, man. Studio yeah. keeps you. Studio life and music keeps you it's, young. It's all the oysters out here in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> I was not eating those yesterday. Um, they just revitalize you. Um. The no the, the yeah like that that muse the rebalance thing in Isotope RX is is fantastic. When you extract a vocal, it does sound really weird and artifacty. Right, and then I'll even kind of try to clean up some of the problems with it. It'll think saxophones or vocals, almost always, and and horn like a like a solo uh, French horn, of course, uh, things like that. Um, but it'll it does a pretty good job of giving you something. And really, when you blend that in onto the existing track to just do a vocal bump it yeah. it doesn't sound artifacty that i'm coming up with and so a lot of jolie's record we're doing that way the ian matthews uh, live release will be has been done that way i desperately yeah. could have used that on that roscoe gordon record i did with Warren really? pash well because i the first gear i had was a task mda 30 dat machine mm -hmm. and i recorded his performances i just Submixed his voice and his piano and his guitar all together oh, yeah. when I yeah and then we built it after that and I was like wow I sure wish I had thought to just put the guitar on the left and the vocal on the right. I was gonna say there's here, there's an know? old trick that we used to have right <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean don't that's a great piece of advice though don't think of a two track recorder as like a stereo recorder think of it as a two track recorder yeah you know as long because, as you got a mixer yeah if you can do you can do something with it later you know capture the things separately. You know, if you're like in a, on location and you've got to track something that you're just, you know, one element's going to be the one that has trouble being heard, then put everything else on the right side and one thing on the left, you know, I mean, it's, it's a good way to think of all that stuff or, yeah. or, you, or you pair up the, the really bright thing and the really deep bassy thing on the one track, you know, so that you can EQ one out. So you can, yeah, you can kind of balance them with EQ or. Yeah, it's a good you know, reminder. Um, EQ is just a frequency specific volume fader. Yeah. I mean, really think of things in a kind of, you have to start thinking of this stuff in the abstract, especially to do this kind of restoration work. You know, the, the stuff I did on, on the, on Jolie's record, and his first song was just crazy. Like, really. And in fact, I, I want to mention a couple of things that really helped. Yeah, okay. please. So there's a company that most people probably don't know about called Raising Jake uh, Studios, and they have um, 
uh, Jeff Rippey, I think his name is, uh, is a real recording engineer and stuff and helps spearhead these prod products that he puts out. And one is called True Midside. And that is a, a plugin that allows you to do uh, to balance, you, you can basically in the in the way the plugin opens, you can turn the middle channel up or down against the sides real easily, um, which is really interesting. You know, so if you uh, many times, obviously vocals and and bass guitars and stuff, kick and snare probably are in the center, and you can kind of just if you have a mix that just needs a little more something in the center like that, you can maybe bring the vocal up. But um, what you can also do is like say create two tracks of a stereo thing that you're working on and just and then just uh process one to be all mid process the other one to be all side and then you know and then double check do a null test against it i did this for the review that i did of this recently in tape op and and the null test was perfect like nothing existed when i put them back together put it against the original mix but so you can have at that point you'll have a center channel and you have a left and right channel and then the next thing you can do is to is to maybe break that center channel into frequency bands, mm -hmm. you know? So there's like uh, Pro Tools has an HD, I think it has the Pro Multiband Splitter, which is like their multiband compressor, but it's just a splitter. You can assign those four bands to auxes that, that you then have like a low, low mid, high mid, highs, and you can change those e frequency points. So it's really just a crossover. We all remember those from doing live sound and things yeah. like that. Uh, so that that can break that band into four bands, um, which can be really, really helpful. Like say maybe take all the lows and just leave them alone. And then and then also, so then you're trying to fix all these elements. Say maybe the there's left and right, like this Catalpa song had left and right phase information that was was in, incoherent. They were out of phase left and right, but everything else in the center of the mix was okay. So now I could take the mid band. And it wasn't the low end was okay too, but I could take the mid band and and separate that and then fix the phase on the left and right and then put it back into the mix with the center channel and then the low channel. And the other thing I'll do, and this is another plugin that Jeff and Raising Jake make, is the uh, Sidewinder. And this plugin is basically kind of like the filters you'd use for cutting vinyl where you'd sum, the mono, sum to mono things in the low end frequencies. Mm -hmm. So it starts at like maybe 98. I think that's what Julie set to somewhere around there. And uh, it sums all that information in the bottom frequencies. This plugin is also great for all those goddamn, especially virtual keyboards that people are using that have left, right moving information right. or out of phase left, right information. Say if it's got some kind of processing of uh, chorusing or something. So this will this will just sum the bottom end. So you have a solid, block of low end for that instrument and and then everything above it's the same as it would be no matter what uh with the with a mix like this where you're rebuilding it and maybe it's got left and right stuff that's bumping back and forth that's really distracting uh you sum the you sum some of that stuff down to mono like at, you know 90 uh hertz or something and then that that holds that part holds that part together and then you're fixing the phase and the mid bands left and right then you've broken up the 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 center channel, maybe maybe leaving the low end alone or compressing it so it just stays kind of more steady. And then the low mids, maybe you're cutting out some frequencies that are obnoxious, and then compressing it a tiny bit. And then the mid range one you might use as the vocal clarity, and then the top stuff you might add a little sparkle to. Maybe even add a little bit of like like stereo reverb to the very top sparkle or the mid band, and bring that into the mix to add a certain kind of depth. So this is all coming from one stereo track, you know. Wow. And I end up with like a whole bank of stuff that that's being processed and maybe at different times in the song things are being processed. When if you, if you were going to encourage the rock stars to tr start messing with this <laughs> stuff, where would be the right place to start cuz it it sounds <clears throat> yeah. it sounds a little advanced too at mm -hmm. the same time, you know. It might be. I mean, this is like this is taking the idea like if you've ever thought that the mastering person was like fucking up your mix, this is this is the mastering. This is like the mastering guy intentionally destroying your mix and rebuilding right. it. You know, totally which I don't think things. most mastering people and the ones I work with are I don't think they would ever dive in like this unless it was a specifically like we are being telling you to do this, you know. 
Well, I think that would, that, that vocal up or down scenario yeah, is something that everybody that might be familiar up. with. Take and, an old mix, find it, just load it in, start messing with it, and see if see what yeah. you can control. You know, yeah. I mean, the mid side control you can you can and the raising Jake stuff you can do trial you know, two week trial or something like that, uh, and they're cheap. They're very affordable. Uh, yeah. Um, and they work and they work and they've null, I've null tested things. It's like, they're good, you know? Right. Um, but that's, that's a real interesting thing because a lot of times in a stereo mix, you can control the vocal level, which is that center channel and mastering engineers do frequently do that as a last resort. All right. Here's know? a, here's a question for you. Yeah. Audio restoration. Yeah. There was always that, that other part of the Celimony company that makes Melodyne where there was, they had this other part of the tool that it was used for. And you're like, Wow, that's a lot more expensive. And it oh, was yeah. their it was their like tape wow and flutter removing thing. Is that one of the tools that you've used for that kind of stuff as well? There's a there's one I haven't used uh, Salomone's version. There is one in Isotope RX. That'll uh, do that as that, well. That'll yeah, okay. kind of take some of that out. And I've used that a tiny, tiny bit. Um that's a crazy one. If you really run into problems with that and you have the original tapes. Um, I really highly recommend a, a company called Plangent Processes Incorporated. Uh, Jamie Howarth uh, has been interviewed in Tape Op before. And I did have some stuff, you know, back in the days, really, before I was even recording, which means, you know, like the 50s or something. Uh, <laughs> but uh, back in the old days, a lot of times uh, there was an era where people, like I would, I would say this is probably late 70s, late 60s into the 70s, um, they would send them home with a demo tape, a little reel, you know, like a home format, uh, quarter track. Yeah. Uh, you reel know, to reel. Out, reel to reel tape. Yeah. A little seven inch reel to reel tape, probably uh, that you could take home playing your Sony or, or Marantz or whatever you had there. Uh, sometimes even Ampex, you know? Um, and so they would send people home with these tapes and a few times I've had to remaster or, or restore off of these tapes like albums and stuff because that was the only we had one scratchy lp and we had this tape and so the tape certainly was more more fidelity left but then you know if those tapes were stored on their sides there would be a warp to them or or just because they maybe they were even tracked off uh, not that well so this is essentially like somebody bringing in for restoration what was the take-home rough mix yeah, just, yeah. They're like real, it'd be the like the version for the you and me, it was probably cassettes or CDRs yeah. even yeah. later, you know. But for for them, um it was uh that was the only way to bring home something to play back, you know, before cassettes. So um those kind of tapes I've sent to to Jamie and and company and they and they've done those transfers and and it's amazing because what they're doing is on the tape, on every analog tape, is a bias frequency, which is really, really high, like 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 fifty to hundred kilohertz. Like it's like a radio frequency right. embedded into the tape, which is how the you get rid of the nonlinearity of tape. Yada, yada. Yeah. This is a whole other discussion for a whole other time, which I am not an expert on. But <laughs> because it's, it's the stickiness of the sound, yeah, the sticky. That. It helps it stay on the tape. It helps keep things from going straight into entropy. Let's put it that way. So the, as far as the magnetism on the tape. Yeah. So yeah. that bias frequency is always there. On a tape deck, you play it back and there's a built-in filter, which just takes it off like a, a shelf filter. Boom, it's gone. Um, and uh, so when in this case, they've removed that filter and they track that to, to one track up in the top frequency. They grab that bias tone and then they grab the audio below it in the lower frequencies. And then be with that, they they are able to say, well, this bias frequency should be a stable frequency. Right, it's like a yeah. benchmark. But they can see it while on flutter, then they can just tune the audio to that while on flutter. Oh, that's interesting. To yeah, removing that, that while Yeah, so then it, then it cleans it all up. So that that really does work. I did it on a, on a record for a, 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 a kind of Broadway-type singer woman that I'd had an album out in the 70s was really rare and I was restoring that. And uh and that that worked really well. It was really cool. So there's there's ways to do that, but there is the wow there are the wow and flutter apps which look for that um and can restore it. Everything's getting a little fancier as we go along. It's getting and, fancier as we get older. I still yeah. like two speakers though. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, do. I mean I, I think two speakers is good. 
<laughs> but it matches uh, the number of years I have. Yeah. I mean, I haven't even heard Atmos yet. And I keep asking colleagues that are working in Atmos. I'm like, but where are people hearing this? And then they go, oh, well, on headphones, you hear the binaural version or something. And I'm like, I'm so confused, but I'm going to work <laughs> it out. I'm not trying to be anti yet. I'm not anti. I'm just waiting. I've um, heard some very cool versions of it, and it's fun to hear when, you, when you're when you in a studio yeah. with the speakers and everything. Yeah, I really, I want to hear. I just, it's funny because it just started, kind of got really rolling right at the beginning of the pandemic. Right, right, <laughs> You know, right. and I was at NAMM show, and Michael Romanowski was going to play me something, and then I got sick, and I left NAMM show. And I never got to hear what he was going to play me the next day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Adam Audio introduces the all-new A-Series line of monitors, featuring the XART accelerated ribbon tweeter design, built-in DSP-based room correction, and speaker voicings, allowing you to customize your Adam Audio monitors to fit your control room. The A-Series will rock in any studio. Small studio spaces or immersive multi-speaker configurations are perfect for the A4V or the new A7V, the next generation of the incredible popular A7X. Mid-sized rooms and narrow spaces will love the low profile of the A44H, expanding on the A7V sound, or the A77H, a true three-way midfield monitor delivering rich, spacious sound. And bigger studios will love the A8H, a three-way speaker and the pinnacle of the A-series that delivers extremely accurate sound required for critical listening environments. Get the Atom Audio Monitor Monitors and subwoofers that are right for your studio with an extended five year warranty at adamaudio.com. Every studio needs a good vintage mic for that classic warm sound. Whether you're looking for those airy highs, sweet mid range, or silky low end, a good vintage mic can put the magic in your mixes. So it's no wonder vintage mics have been loved and praised by thousands of engineers for decades. The Jay Z Microphone Vintage Series are built by hand in Latvia using only the best electronic components and feature the patented Golden Drop capsule design for great detail and richness of tone that will bring that classic vintage vibe to your studio and be a real workhorse for your sessions. This time, our friends at Jay-Z Microphones have come up with a special offer just for you, rock stars. Use the coupon ROCKSTAR to get 40% off the Vintage Series mics V67, V47, or V12, the mic you're hearing right now. Plus, they'll throw in a free shock mount worth $120 for a limited time at Jay-Z Microphones. Mike.com. Well, um, let's see. There's some other, um, I don't want to cut you short on that yeah, if you got more no, to no, say no. about the restorations, well, but well, I, I also you know, noticed in the playlist was a, a yeah. pavement record. Oh, yeah, that's Terror right. Terror Twilight, too. Terror Twilight. So here, here's a crazy one. This is, this is an interesting thing that happened also with a band called Worthington that I uh, remixed recently, uh, which had, uh, there were, Friends I had recorded in 99, Pink Pavement was like 99 as well. So uh, these are from, you know, like in the Worthington case, it was like, we've got the master tapes. We've got, um, we don't have the DAT tape you mix to, you know? And, and we you're wanna, like, thank God. <laughs> and we want to, I know, kind of, and we want to re-release this. And, and I was like, well, if I'm going to remix that, like you could burn it, you could take it off the CD the release CD, it would be fairly accurate, you know, right? to what, and you maybe pull it off of a few different copies and just double check for errors. But I was also like, do you want to just have him just go for it and make a new version of the album, you know, new mixes? And we did. And it was crazy because that, that album I had mixed off of 24 track tape to, I'm pretty sure it was 24, 24 or 16. Honestly, I'm forgetting now. But then, and then uh, through my Allen and Heath Saber console, which was a funny console I used to have. And there were really times, you know, talking about mixing and stuff earlier, there were times where I couldn't really replicate the sound I was getting back then. I was able to do yeah. things so much better, like things were more in phase now and <laughs> and stuff like that. And I was able to clean up the vocals with an isotope and stuff like that. But I was not able to get this sort of like crazy 
grit and glue that this crappy yeah. old console had. Yeah. And that was, that was interesting. You know, I, I liked the challenge. I like that it's different, you know, if the, it's not a band that has like thousands of fans, you know, I don't, I don't think maybe a thousand, uh, but you know, people were excited to hear it again. And, uh, and we made it sort of, sort of different, but sort of similar. The yeah. Pav- the pavement thing was from the, exactly the same era actually. And, um, I, I think within days of each other where they were in the studio, if I remember right. And, uh, the, uh, the, the case for that was they were beginning work on, I, I'd done demos for Steven Malcolmus for the previous, uh, Brighten the Corners album. Yeah. I, I recorded demos in my basement studio and now I was a couple years into my new jackpot commercial studio and, uh, they came out pavement all lived in different cities and they just came there to kind of just reconvene. And it wasn't like, you know, you know, Steven's, you know, thing to me was like, well, if, if we hear something happening, maybe we'll lay it down to tape, but there's no pressure to make a record, you know, right. contrary to what some books and websites and things seem to say that I had, I made a record that they, they didn't like, which is absolutely, <laughs> I've I've seen things that kind of say that or infer that like things that technically jackpot wasn't up to it and all sorts of weird shit. Like, no, they were rehearsing. Jesus right. fucking Christ, leave me alone. Right. You know. So anyway, <laughs> but uh, one of the songs uh, I just looked it up yesterday and totally forgot the title of it. One of the songs um, was considered for releasing on this kind of box set thing, and so uh, Steven still had the tapes, so he came by and dropped them off. And I, I remixed it, and I think I just did like a single revision where I just put his voice. His vocal never sounds right with reverb on it. No, not much. Yeah. What do is, you do when you're mixing yeah. uh, pavement vocal? You do keep it pretty dry. Put a little something, like a little tiny bit of ambience, but nothing extensively. Not nothing with a long decay. You know, and I think that kind of works best. His vocal is really front and center dry. You know, no matter how those rec- all those records. Um, Actually, Generally, I'm looking in yeah. the playlist uh, yeah. that I put That's, together, and now I don't see yeah. it for some reason. But it was there earlier. I couldn't. Uh, there were there were tracks uh, that were added to that playlist that I didn't work on, so I, I couldn't find. Got it. You. I could, and I couldn't add to it. Yeah. Okay. So, no worries. No worries. Yeah, it's called something something jackpot in quotations. So it's pretty okay. Obvious. Cool. Uh, but so yeah, I went back and remixed that track, um, and and you know, kind of listen to the studio version and listen to my version and it's pretty just straightforward in that case it's sort of you you hear that a lot when you do archive work box sets and stuff if you are asked to remix a song from 20 30 years ago this is 20 years ago plus um you know just kind of mix it kind of simply right you know because you you hear that like a great example of doing that wrong is uh is the velvet underground stuff that came out uh vu and another view uh in the 80s maybe or 90s and and they got a hold of these tapes of stuff and they kind of just slicked them up a little bit put a lot of digital reverb on i think so it's the right settings (laughs) yeah they didn't they didn't i mean marine tucker said like you know there's no there's none of the grit that was on the original you know like there's something weird too clean you know so yeah. just kind of sometimes you're just trying to push the faders up and just balance it and go done, you know, as long as instruments aren't just disappearing at points or, yeah or whatever you're trying to, you're trying to do as little as possible and just put a real document type mix, you know? Yeah. I've had interviews with um, Craig Parker Adams um, talking about remixing the Frank Zappa live tapes like that. Mm-hmm. And it seemed like that was a big part of it. It's really understanding, you know, just how to, to respectfully, you know, bring up that that kind of the essence of what it what it already was yeah i mean the, in the right kind thing, of way the best thing when you're mixing a live record is is can someone send me like a, a video or even just photos of what the stage setup was right. where are the where are the players where are the players yeah you know when i did uh i did that melanie record um uh, jury lane in 1974 theater royale something like that it's got several titles at this point i think and i did this these remixes or these mixes of this thing it had been a radio broadcast but it had been multi-tracked and 
in that case, most of it's her solo playing acoustic guitar and singing. So that's pretty obvious. You just kind of center it with some ambience, right? Some crowd noise around it, whatever. And then uh, the guys from Incredible String Band joined her for a few songs. And so that I, I never, I had a picture in my head of where they were, but I don't think I ever had a photo of them all playing together. And it was so, it would have been so great to see like if the musicians, if the other person singing was left or right of her, you know, right. audi- audience perspective, of course. Would you have, you would yeah. have done audience. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, what I, about I, when you're mixing drums? Do you like to do drummer's perspective for the hi hat or audience? I prefer audience because it makes more sense to me. But um, you know, sometimes you can be wrong because maybe it's a left-handed drummer. That's true. <laughs> so, but you know, sometimes it sounds good for the artist if it's drummer's perspective and they, the drummer feels better. So, I'll I'll do whatever people ask, but I'll, I'll start with audience. Yeah, I'll tell you what sucks is when we would do those Bonnaroo hay bell sessions mm-hmm. and we'd have one hour with each band and you got to come in, you got 10 minutes to sound check, record and mix three songs, Yeah, you know, the mass room turn around and in would walk a left-handed drummer oh, and yeah. that, your 10 minutes was used up r- switching the drum set around with the same, moving all the mics and everything. Yeah. It's not the easiest way to do that. Is there? It's no. the strangest thing. It's like, it's, it shouldn't be that difficult, but it really, yeah, you know my my wife's a drummer, uh, Jenna Jenna Zine, and she said when she first started drum lessons, the drum the teacher said, "Do you really want to sit left handed?" <laughs> He's like, "It'll make your life easier." Yeah, and she's like, "I just and she's left handed as far as writing and stuff too." So she just was like, "Somehow yeah. this this feels right," you know, to her. Yeah, it's, do you do you think that um, Hendrix ever looked for a left-handed bass player and a left-handed drummer? That'd be amazing. If he did. The lefties, Hendrix, the, and lefties, the lefties, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the bass player would have to flip his bass, o- flip a well, right Paul, bass over. Yeah, Paul was already in a band. Yeah, yeah, right. Paul was already in a band. Um, all right, cool. So um, let me see. Can I jump forward with some questions yeah. for you? Yeah, all yeah. Right, do so, um, Abronia Map of Dawn. If I'm pronouncing that mm. right. And mm-hmm. and Tagonic sound of um I wrote down that they both just had this great kind of intimate up close soft and wide drum sound. Mm-hmm. And um they're just both great sounding records, probably quite different. But um what do what do you want to say about those sessions? What what were some things you remember about um that stuff? Ah, Bronia was cool because that's a really strange band. Like, I mean not strange, but there's they're trying to get into like a trancey kind of zone anyway, to a degree. And the one of the things about that band is it's really that there's no drum kit. It's a it's a big, huge kind of like kick drum, marching kick drum, like oh, on its side, on its side, being played with mallets and stuff. Uh, so there's really like this different thing going on. Um, That's probably why I picked up on that kind of soft up closeness. Yeah, and I was just mixing that. Um, I don't know why, but I'm blanking on where it was tracked. I don't recall. It was um, tracked in a studio. In a studio. I forget who did that. Uh, but they did a good job because there was like, you know, room, there were distant mics and close mics and all the stuff that you could want. And and so it was about just getting that balance. I haven't listened to that record since it came out. Like, shit. Great, um, great album cover, too. I, I was really happy... They, there was a that was a fully that was kind of a nerve wracking session because it's like uh, mask you know all masked up. I think it's pre oh, yeah. pre uh, uh, getting shots and uh, you know vaccines, and uh, and we had to like kind of be in there and have all these little rules about like I'd go outside just to drink water, you know. I I, yeah. I did one session like that. Yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> uh, that's how I felt about it too. <laughs> yeah, but that, but. Um, but it yeah, wasn't that, horrible that, being with them. That was amazing. And the no, input, no, no, yeah. the band's input was very, very important. I felt uh, very focused and, and they knew what they wanted. And uh, I think it was cool. I really like textural things. I mentioned earlier how much I like reverbs in certain ways and stuff. And yeah. I love I love textural music. And I love sort of like, uh, this reminded me of like Savage Republic and... Uh, uh, and stuff from the eighties that I really liked, like kind of droney trance kind of rock stuff. If that makes sense, kind of precursors to what people call shoegaze in a lot of cases, right. you know? Yeah. I always or, wondered with shoegaze, yeah. the shoegaze thing. I was like, I was like, wait, 
is the band looking at their shoes or am I looking at my shoes watching the band? <laughs> I was We're like, all who's, looking, who's looking at, at each his other. shoes? <laughs> We're all looking at each other's shoes. Come on. You know, that's the truth. Like, hey, where do you get those shoes? Where do you get those shoes? Those are some <laughs> nice, great heels. Nice, nice trainers. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. So, what? Um. What? How did you get some of those great reverbs on that? What are? What were some things you remember choosing to do? Uh, in I the don't mix? know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here's here's my typical thing on the the Rupert Neve Designs 5088. Uh, in the monitor section, there's also the bus section, of course, and there's the aux returns up on the top. There's four knobs, and you can assign them to buses or left right. You have you have eight buses, and you have uh, the left right. And up there, I will have uh, I have a modified EMT one hundred and forty plate, which has uh, all Hamptone electronics in it, and and it's also got a Dynamount, you know, the Dynamount mic mover thing. Yeah. Uh, so it's got a single axis Dynamount mounted to the wheel on the top of the one hundred and forty that sets the decay time. Oh, nice! So from the computer at an app, I can change the 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 amount of dampening. Or wow. damping, damping, I should say, the amount of damping that's being applied, you know, with that big, f- weird, wooly plate thing, ne- that big thing next to the plate, uh, and you move it. You so you can move back and forth while you're listening to the exact reverb, which is that's amazing. great. You, you know, I've got a I've yeah. got a plate in my studio, and it yeah. had a button with a meter, and you could like yeah control it, the, the, but I, I, we never hooked it up. <laughs> the old school, yeah, same here. We had some of that stuff, and it was like I didn't have any way to run the cables between the rooms. Yeah, uh, we'd already we already packed. There's a under underground. There's a PVC pipe that's so packed with audio that we were squirting soap in there, and you know, oh trying to get God. the last couple of cables through. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that wasn't going to like work. Like a prison break. Running a new yeah. line is like a prison break. Yeah, it that. would have been impossible. But the <laughs> the remote thing, the Dynamount, is amazing at it, and you can control it with your phone or the app on the computer. Really and did cool. they make a dedicated um, plate no. Dynamount? No, or you I just, showed you just it. Rerigged it. I've showed it to them. I sent them photos and video and stuff, and they were like, what? <laughs> That's great. Well, I, I will and tell then, you, I'm, yeah. I'm just out of curiosity how you used to do it. I always just go to the plate, and I put my ear to the plate, and I just yeah. adjust it, like, listening With acoustically, yeah, yeah. just to see what hear. I think. You can Ours hear something. Is the, big, the big wooden box, so it's harder to hear, but you can kind of hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, let's see. So next to that, 140 with the, okay, and the 140 uh emt comes back out it's sent through a quad eight reverb on the way in where i've sculpted the, what's, what the elisis what is no, that the elisis no 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 oh, quad, quad, eight, quad eight quad eight quad eight is in the console yeah oh, I'm yeah yeah quad reverb, yes. reverb. yeah yeah so it's a quad eight reverb from an old quad eight console a four band with filters so i i i, to, I take some of the low mids and stuff and lows out of it that i'm sending i might brighten it if i want a certain sound and then on the way back, it goes back to another pair. The returns come into the another pair of quad eight reverbs. And I'm still taking frequencies out that are getting too swampy and too overwhelming. I'm taking the haze out. And then I'm putting all my effects, all my analog effects or outboard effects, then go to gates, uh, in noise gates, and that are set to have a really, uh, a fairly quick re- attack, but a long release and, and, and hold sustain uh, so that, this basically takes any of the background noise that the devices are making. Cause in the case of plates and springs, you always have noise going on. And a lot of the right. digital gear has hash going on all the time. So all my gear comes back and it goes into a whole rack full of gates that I clean these up with. Uh, the, the next device would be a spring reverb, which could be a, a Benson Tallbird studio Tallbird, uh, which is a tube based one that's made here in town. Or uh, Demeter, two different versions of the Demeter Real Reverb, uh, a silver one and a black one, and they're different eras, uh, Real Reverb 2 or whatever that second one was called. And uh, and uh, those have different, one of them has long springs in it, one has short and long, like they're custom, the one's custom set up, the newer one. So I'll pick one of those three. Plus, also, I just have a surfy bear, uh, surfy bird i don't know this crazy one that's that's comes from made in italy designed in sweden or somewhere and it's based on some of the 
some of the, I'm trying to be, I need to work on a review of it, actually. It's based on the old Fender tanks that we'd, you'd kick around the floor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so it's kind of like that. It's a little weird. It's got a weird left-right thing. I've been reviewing. I've been using that. It's kind of cool for lead guitars. It's a little more subtle. And then uh, the next device is a Lexicon PCM60 mm-hmm. for drum drum ambience. There's definitely some of that on that Abronia record. Absolutely. And and I'll pick the settings. It's so simple as the push buttons on the front. You just pick them and go for it. And, and then, again, this was a record that you were mixing on the console. I yeah, think I absolutely. That yeah, absolutely. And then uh, usually the last device is an Echo uh, Line 6 Echo Pro. Um, which is the green rack mount yeah, delay. Yeah, it's a great delay. delay. It's a fantastic delay. I used to have two, and I wish I hadn't sold the the other one. I, ha- I still have the green pedal, and it's just... Yeah, I got that too. Yeah, it's really good. It's a, The sounds are really good, and they really are kind of mid-rangey and tape-like, you know. So I have all that. There's other old-school mono digital delays, uh, and uh, um, oh my God, there's all kinds of... Yeah, an Ibanez... Uh, AD202 and and my space echo and a full tone tube tape echo, which is like an echoplex. Yeah. But I can I can rack the, run those through uh the EXT uh EX wait, what do you call those? The radial EXCT, the they're like a reamper and a DI right. box in right. one. Right. Uh, I got a couple of those in my 500 rack, so I can do stuff outboard really fast. So there's a lot of that going on, and I probably use stuff in the box too when I'm getting some of the deeper ambiences. You know, I'll use like uh, Valhalla uh, reverbs, like the Shimmer. I really, really, really like, which is like makes instant Eno stuff. You know, yeah, I love those plugins. Yeah. It, it's tricky because um, I haven't figured out yet. I wish Pro Tools would let me make my own folders of plugins instead of having to. Mm-hmm. And if if I can, I don't know how to do it yet, but um be really great if you could hack that somehow and and make just a folder of favorite plugins you, you, well, you can do that little thing on the top but there's only a certain amount i think you whatever. only get to put like two up there or something yeah, I, I think more now there's more do you? okay I'll, yeah. I'll go look check again. it out it'll hold more check yeah. it out <laughs> yeah i mean there's so many the way current recording daws are set up there's so many obstacles to working efficiently yeah and well i will you know every time i open logic i'm like what the fuck is this hellhole? You know, like <laughs> I just hate it. You know, I can't, nothing makes sense. You can't even, is there any way to set a bit depth? Like, wow. You know, it's really weird, you know? Yeah. And, um, I just, the mixing portions of it make no sense. Like, I've, I find it's, it's excellent if you just want to compose something quickly. Yeah. 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 Great and for I've, that. I've, I've mixed hundreds and thousands of tracks recorded in logic so it's great yeah. for that yeah but i i don't know how anyone mixes in it i don't really think i've talked to very few people that have ever said they've been happy mixing it howdy rock stars do you ever feel like you're spending all this time watching youtube videos trying out mixing tricks and tweaking version after version of your mixes but it's just like not getting you anywhere have you ever wished that you could have more of a simple and straightforward process for creating a pro mix that wouldn't take you years to learn look what if you could have a grammy winning mix engineer who understood all of your mixing struggles and could actually coach you through them if these are any of the questions that you're struggling with, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover this proven step-by-step mixing system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Listen to this quote from one of the students. Absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information and mentoring on the mix process I've ever been a part of. It was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along the way, condensed into a six to seven hour session. That's from David P. Look, if you already understand the basics of mixing, but you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then go to ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and check it out. In fact, I'm so confident that you're going to love this, that if you can't get a great sounding mix within 30 days, just send me an email and I'll give you a full refund, no questions asked. So go ahead and take your mixes to the next level like you know you want to at ultimatemixingmasterclass.com.
I'm working on uh, learning how to mix in it at the moment because I was teaching a class up at my college and every everybody in the schools, they all use logic because the schools are just like, oh, we can just buy this for, you know, the the educational yeah, yeah. price one yeah. time and be done with it. So, they, yeah, so every yeah. time I go to a school setting, it's all logic sessions. And I'm like, all right, time to learn how to use this thing, Ledge. Yeah, I know. I can export tracks really well, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've learned that, Yeah, you know. But uh, yeah, I mean, that, that Abronia record was really fun to do. And one of the things I really liked was having that, that input. And, and one of the things they were trying to go for was this. The previous record, which totally seems fine to me, but they really regretted the process of it just kind of nitpicking the mixes and going back and forth like remotely with each other even and the engineer maybe. Um, the, the, the thing I had been told was like, we really want to get these mixes done and sign off and be, that's the record. Right, and, and they, your and console they, helped. Yeah, yeah, and being so mixing on the console kind of gives it a finality. And they uh, they really stuck to that. I don't think we did any revisions. I don't. I really don't recall that we did. Um, you know, it was just like maybe I'm wrong, but I think it was really done when they left. That's and, great. And I really appreciate that because you know we can all make mistakes or we can get tired and turn the vocal up too loud or too quiet. You know, and things like that can happen. But uh, you know, everyone talks about the magic of the studio and all these things and the mix really can be on a console can be a performance and stuff but people more and more don't allow that to happen at all they just you know they just really they they want to micromanage the bejesus out of things and well it's interesting you know i wonder if people really want that or if just the tech has just pointed us in that direction and where else are you going to go you know it's like yeah. Because we live in this world of just pull the session back up. Yeah. It just became part of the dialogue, you know? Yeah, that's why I had to start moving my remote mixing to, to mostly in the box because I would just be like, you know, I can't undo. I mix that through the console. That's your drum mix. Like, yeah. if I undo that, it means I got to go back down there, set all this stuff up, you know, at least like eight channels or 10, 12 channels of stuff. Plug yeah. it all back in, get all the settings. I mean, it's insane. I can't, I couldn't make any money working that way. I would be working yeah. for 10, five dollars an hour, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do, uh, certainly, I mean, we don't have to be go down nostalgia lane forever, but <laughs> you know, those, those sessions where like all five people in the control room are grabbing a fader or a mute button and you're mixing that way, that was, it was a fun way to do stuff. You know. If if it worked, <laughs> if it worked <laughs> when it when it worked, I mean, there were time, there's times that I absolutely adore. I mean, I always absolutely adore now being able to set up a little process for that part of the song and it's done. You know, yeah. build a little thing in Pro Tools where that vocal at that point goes into an echo and then fades out or turns into a reverb, and I'm done. I don't have to sit there and move these knobs in a weird pattern to guess when it's coming in, and I, you know, I don't miss any of that at all, honestly. But I do miss that sort of feeling like, okay, we, we hit a plateau here. This sounds great. Print it. We're done. You yeah. know, if we really screwed up, come back and let's do this again. Well, mixing but, mixing you know. in those situations was a bit like tracking sessions where mm-hmm. you're just trying to get the whole team to score a goal together. Yeah. And does it, yeah. you know, the, the end rant in the new issues is by my friend John Plymel. And he says in that, he says, you know, when people come back out of the room, he'll say, are you, are you, don't listen for what you did wrong. Listen for which take makes you excited. Right. And I think that's the thing. Like Steve Fisk has mentioned something like this to me as well. Like how bummed he is at remote mixing and stuff. And I think that's the thing is like, you know, when you do it, when you play music, you look for like magical moments and excitement and cohesion and, working as a becoming one as a group almost or something, you know, and then, or, or, or a perfect take, you know, the perfect emotion and you want excitement. They're not looking for mistakes. You know, we're not, we're not, we shouldn't be thinking about mistakes. You know, if there's a, a mix never has a mistake, a mix can be unlistenable, but it's not a mistake. It's just an idea an iteration of what it could be. Well, it's like the difference between going and seeing, uh, an indie rock show where you where you just remembered that the show felt great versus 
sitting around and watching American Idol with, you know, <laughs> nah. with with my ex-in-laws where like everybody, all the commented, all the comments were whether somebody hit the note or not. <laughs> so it's like, right. It's like, I was like wow. that doesn't feel like music to me. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's obvious, an obvious case of like looking at the wrong, the wrong thing, you know? Right. Right. If you're just looking yeah. to find the yeah. thing that's wrong with it, that's not much fun. It, it's like, I, I used to tell people, it's kind of like, uh, it's like looking for love, but talking about sex, you know? <laughs> yeah yeah you kind of you gotta you gotta kind of find a balance there <laughs> um let me let me ask you some sort of all-around studio questions a couple yeah. here before we got to go if you, if you yeah, got a few minutes but oh yeah you know you've got a console you've got a you've run a full studio you're doing remote stuff um cables and patch bays do you what do you want to say to the rock stars about the importance of choosing good cable uh, do we need to look for expensive cables do we look for you know stuff that we can afford um yeah. on mm. amazon and sweet waters and things like that uh, what, what are some thoughts you have about you, that world you know what's crazy we've got about a thousand points in our patch bay i think we do and and it's all tt the small kind right tiny telephone thank you john vanderslice uh and uh the the thing that's really great the one thing that blows that's great is is for the the amount of surface area you can really jam them in there as opposed to like quarter inch or or, or standard telephone size. Yeah, and you know, and that's that's really good. But I'll tell you one thing. My my here's here's there's one major 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 regret for how we set up Jackpot fifteen years ago is we soldered we bought used ones and we soldered a lot of them. Yeah, and I would say to anybody right now have somebody like we used redco for a lot of stuff later on have someone like redco or a or qualified cable uh you know ends manufacturing place like that puts all the cables together for you you spec them they build them have them do this and just get db25 patch bays where you, where you plug into the back make it all really modular and really easy to undo and and change um because there's there's some things that we'd want to change and if we i'm afraid if we pull one of these rack space units of the of the the patch bays out that we're gonna break some solder joints honestly i've, I've felt that way for yeah. ages you know that's terrifying we used a a lot of the red coat cable they make is real similar to like magami and canary and stuff like that and it's totally it's totally good quality but it's not bank breaking you know so we used most of the cables in the studio are all red co house brand cable and uh, but the patch bay, the jumpers themselves, a bunch of the ones that we're using and still using, we bought. There's some generic, no name brand I found on eBay, unbelievable, and we're still using them. Fifteen those are the, years those later, those are the cables themselves. The patch, yeah, cables? the little jumper cables, yeah, like yeah. we have long, the long the colored colorful ones. ones, yeah, the that's colorful ones, just generic. I don't know who made them. Some Chinese company, right? They were and a lot I've less all, than getting the uh, the Megami ones back, in right. The and I kind of wonder, and then I bought some short stubby ones because we don't have anything hardly normal. So I bought these ones for jumpers that are short from uh, Redco. They're actually molded and they're really good too. We've barely thrown any of those out. But we throw more of the colored ones out, but uh, not that many, you know, the longer ones. Uh, you know, if one starts acting weird and you can kind of shift the back of the cable and hear it cut in and out, you just throw it away. But, uh, not, you know, that wasn't that didn't seem to be the main uh, problem point and the thing that's great is if they were shitty you could just throw them all away get a new batch and you don't yeah. have to undo all your wiring but you know i'm not i'm not a stickler for cabling but i with a lot of things i'll just kind of shoot for like a medium high level of quality and then and and just kind of just so i don't have to think about it instead of trying to low budget it yeah because all, all the low budgeting i used to do just seemed to bite me in the butt later you know? yeah that's that's sort of my take on it too so i have heard cables that really do sound magnificently good you know well magnificent is a big word that, yeah. that i could hear that they sounded better than something else I, when i did a sort of a side by side yeah but i do at times also feel like you know that and it's like a classic storyline where where you learn that a mic into one cable straight into a mic pre straight to tape sounds can sound better than going through a bunch of stuff Right, and right. It's way there. And, you know, there are times where I'm like, gosh, I wish I had, didn't have long cable runs in the studio or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
But um, but the uh, you know your advice, your tip for the DB twenty five, that's huge. And then I was trying yeah. to remember the name, and I got it here. So Ben um, Sabin, Sabine, Sabin, if I'm saying your name right, Ben. Sorry about that. From Trace Audio, he'd come by my studio. Yeah, and he introduced me to something else, and I was trying to remember what it was called. But it's a it's individual connectors on the back of a patch bay that are the three three pins in a plastic thing so that mm, you can mm. in having to do instead of having to do groups of eight or wire your own yeah. db25 you could easily kind of get in and out um so that mm. can be a cool thing to look at too yeah I that's done cool that. yeah and then there's the if you've got a smaller system or a smaller amount of things to patch not, not a thousand points but uh the flock stuff the digitally controlled yeah. patch bay I'm I'm really curious about the you know obviously the terror of that would be it, it it'd be like an old automation system on a console like if if they went out of business tomorrow and you had one of these you might have to keep some kind of weird retro unit going in the corner retro yeah. computer going to keep it running like the old auto automation systems and stuff yeah how you many know? things do, how many things like that do we already have in our studio anyway right and that's things scary if they went out of business we, what that's would we scary do? yeah it's spooky right you know but it's like it is such a brilliant idea to to do like digitally controlled patch bay switching because you know if it if the relays and things in there if they're not relays i don't know what they're even using if that stuff is is quality and and everything sounds good which i, I can pretty much have been told it is um then that could be a way to just you know call up like a patch bay I, that would be make it easier to call up analog mixes and do all sorts of things on my end but i can't yeah. afford i can't afford to outfit my studio yeah those, yeah i mean that's you know? the thing i think that's the big takeaway rockstars is yeah be thoughtful about how you set up your studio because inevitably my take is whatever you decide to do is probably going to work. So you're probably going to have your studio there for a long time yeah, and yeah. you're probably going to get deeper and deeper into it where you get, you know, you don't really want to have to undo something to try and change it later. So yeah. really consider how you can be flexible down in the future. And I think the one I was trying to think of is the EDAC, E-D-A-C. Mm -hmm. right, right. I think it's like little plastic three point connectors. Right. I have never used those. That's a good idea though. Yeah. yeah. And okay. then Rockstar's Redco Audio is still a company. It's you can still yeah. go to the redco.com yeah. website and find yeah, you can, cables and connectors and stuff. And they'll 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 do I mean, there are frequently there were times that the cost that they it would cost me for them to build me a specialized cable was less than me buying the parts or just barely more. Hmm. You know, like it was like, well, why not have them do it? They're sit there, they've got all the custom gear set up to help them make the cables really clean and 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 do the, the trim the ends and do everything you know beautifully yeah and dur durably let's put it that way you know so professionally made cables gonna always 90 percent of the time be better than what you're gonna do because i'm honestly i don't know about anyone else but i am i hope when i pick up a soldering iron i'm like i hope i don't do this for another six months like <laughs> i don't want to solder i've done yeah i've done so much goddamn soldering in my life yeah I'm me just too over it me over too. it Oh. And I, now I have to have reading glasses. I don't have a reading glasses yeah. just to have this conversation with you. <laughs> yeah, here's my here's my soldering glasses. Yep. I got to put on reading yeah. glasses just to hear shit now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you um, you got to have them on the mix because you got to be looking at the computer screen all day. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Uh, you got time for one more question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I noticed in your, over at Jackpot at least, um, showing off the what's on the console, I saw some kind of big near field speakers, NS10s, mm -hmm. Oratone, mm -hmm. sort of cleverly put together. I don't know what you have right when you're mixing mm -hmm. it at home, but what do you want to say yeah. about different speakers, speakers and, and when when do you find them useful to check things on those different speakers? I so our big speakers at the studio are 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 um um oh my god, what do you what do you call? <laughs> Are they the ATCs or something? ATCs. Like that? I couldn't yeah. remember the three letters. Uh, ATC SCM twenty five A's. So they're pretty common. Uh, they're 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 beautiful sounding. We have a a Carl Tatz uh, subwoofer as well. Oh, cool. the I, Ice twelve. The or something. Ice Cube. Yeah. Or ice something Cube. Like that. Yeah. Uh, we have his one of his subs, which is a thousand dollars, and performs very 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 well. Highly recommended. Thank you, Carl. Nice guy. Carl and, Rocks. uh, 
And then we have um, the NS10s because that's what the studio looks like. And then we have uh, Auratones, actually, the little the little remakes of the, uh, uh, I mean, our Avant tones, the remakes of the Aura tones, the little, the little cream colored cubes. Um, I honestly, when I'm working 99.9% of the time, I don't turn on the NS tens. I just don't have any interest in them anymore. That's just me. I, they're up for everyone else to use if they want to had a client request that we use them a while back. So I did. And it's, you know, you hear stuff on them, yeah. but, um, I really mostly just work on the ATCs with the sub on and, and I also had set up a headphone system probably with the little labs monitor. Uh, and I made these special. That's um, Jonathan's uh, headphone. Yeah. Yeah. Box. John, little labs. Yeah. I made these little boxes that, uh, Hamptone made them for me. It's a foot switch with just TRS inputs. Yeah. And so you can turn headphones off and on without changing their volume. Just leave it on the floor, and I. Oh, I could, so you I put those turn. out in the live room, so it's, so to mute no, the headphones. Well, I, I would just if in the people, control room if people would figure that out. Yeah. But when I'm mixing, I'll have headphones set up with a foot switch, so I can just turn them off and set them on the producer's desk and keep working, and not have them blasting behind me. You know, so I, I yeah. use I do that, but um, yeah, most of the time I'm mixing on the ATCs with the subwoofer in really gently, just a little bit of subwoofer. And then uh, I'll occasionally go to the Aura tones and I will listen, uh, Avant tones, sorry. Jesus. Yeah, Avant uh, tones, that's what I have too. Yeah, yeah. I'll, just I'll go to the one. Yeah, I'll go to those and I'll listen for a while and see what sticks out or what's working. Where's the kick? Where's the bass? What, what volume would you have? That, would you have those down really quiet? Uh, moderate, moderate on the little speakers, probably a little louder on the big speakers. I'm, yeah. I'm usually, I'm usually right around that Fletcher Monson world. You know, I'm just like 85 right up, DB or whatever. Yeah. 85, 82, somewhere in there. Yeah. yeah I find little, a, I was, I was just checking under. 85 and I find 85 sounds a little loud to me. <laughs> a little loud. Yeah. So I'm just right below that usually. Yeah. Totally yeah. 80 probably. Uh, you know, most of the time, you know, uh, I'll, I'll turn it. I'll turn it down and listen a little bit sometimes to see what, what sticks out again. But, you know, really the, the multi-speaker thing I think is important. I, I do, I do think having extra speakers is kind of interesting and a good way to keep you on, on the ball and the headphone check is something I'll do maybe once during the, the print of the song or something, just in case something's really weird. But yeah, but I really, I really don't have to do, how would I put this? I don't want to sound cocky or anything, but it's like, I really do know what I'm doing when I'm mixing and I really do know why I'm doing it. And a lot of it is sort of intuitive, but it's really fast and I get it set up and I pan things out and I do certain things I'm always going to try to do first and I get it done and I, I don't end up having to second guess where I'm panning things or stuff like that, unless the clients just want things panned differently, mm -hmm. you know? So I feel like a lot of the work happens really, really fast. Like, Half my mixing time is probably cleaning tracks and Isotope RX. Yeah. And the and then, and then I just start dropping them into place. I have a template in the box, a template that I use that kind of starts to just put things in places I want them and, and give me tools to work with things. But I don't have, it doesn't, there's hardly anything that automatically gets added, but they're there to turn on and use, yeah. if that makes sense, like a console. And I think you mentioned Drumagog was something that you use sometimes. I use is frequently, that, yeah. That, that's sort of like drum reinforcement. Drum replacement option. sample. Yeah. You can drop samples in on you know on the existing drum tracks. Cause you know, like the uh we were talking about stuff that like um revisiting old tracks and all the restoration work. I've been remixing an album for David Stoops, who's a local musician, and a friend of ours attracted it who uh, it passed away. Uh, this guy, Brian Berg, he's really fantastic musician and stuff, but he was experiencing hearing loss as he was still producing and recording. And he, he would on, on David's record, he plays like tons of the instruments, like drums, bass, guitars, singing, piano, whatever. And he does a great job. And he always got, you know, he got sounds and they were usually pretty good. But as his hearing got worse, he would start getting harsher and sharper sounds to try to something was missing in his mm -hmm. perception. And so some of like some of the snares are like really seriously like when you compress a snare to the point that you just have that first little transient that gets past the detector yeah. circuit yeah. and then and then it squashes it down so it looks like almost like a 
a T laying on its side <laughs> when you look at the waveform. Yeah. So it's just like this pit, you know? Yeah, and, the old popcorn sound, the popcorn yeah. drums. And there's a few things you can do with that. And digitally, you can look ahead and squash it more, kind of try to re- rebuild it. But, you know, in some places, you just don't get a snare sound out of that track, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I'll put a sample in there and blend it in under and try to find when it sounds like that snare sounded in the room mic or something. Well, that's you know, cool. So, yeah, little things like that. But I never, um, I never, I never automatically add samples to stuff or I don't have any of that. I don't have any of that really weird rote stuff that I sometimes hear about from mixing engineers. Yeah. You know? This episode is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own record, Skadoosh, the soundtrack to this podcast, in fact, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. These techniques would work for you no matter what DAW you're using right now. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins in Pro Tools. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads to practice your mixing and even include in your mix portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Well, it's fascinating to me. I mean, I mean, again, we could probably go on for another 10 hours. Yeah. So we may just oh, have to yeah. like, yeah, we'll yeah. just have you back five more times before, Wait. you know, four episodes ago comes out. Yeah, but, um, yeah. but, you know, you've done so many interviews with so many people. I, I've done a bunch now on the podcast. It's got to be really eye-opening to you to just see how the variety of ways that people make records. And, oh, yeah. Man, you know. it's a, it's so cool, you know. I interviewed uh, Michael League of Snarky Puppy recently, and he talked, you know, they do a lot of live sort of in the studio or in a space. Uh, they do a, a studio album, but there's people in the studio watching, you know, and yeah. they get their own mix, and, and you know, they're generally pretty quiet during the show, and then you just hear a little bit of like, hey, woo. You know, but the band gets to play to somebody and yeah, like, oh, that's kind of cool. That's a good idea. Okay. Especially for what they're doing, you know? Yeah. And otherwise uh, they're just all playing to Larry. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's times where you're like, I can only, I'm trying to be the technician and the audience, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the producer, you know, so there, there, there's that there's stuff like that. You, you know, you just get different stuff from different people at times and it's really, um, I don't know. The the thing that you could do tape op for like, you know, 26, seven years now, you know, because there's so many different ways to do it. You know, there's so many different ways to make a record. It doesn't have to be a studio. doesn't have to be just a home. You know, the, this, the stuff we're talking about, a lot of these mixes, we're taking home recorded stuff and restoring them or taking home recorded stuff and making a brand new mix for somebody for a release or, or maybe they sent, you know, like I had someone recently, the guy was sending really great songs, but the drum and the drum programming was great, but it just sounded like drum programming. And I was like, dude, send it to Tony Sanfilippo and he'll track drums for you. And he did. And it sounded so cool. And he, Tony put creative ideas into it and made it really, really come to life. You know, that's so great. We can do these crazy, like collaborating or, 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 you know, hiring out as needed and yet working from home on a modest amount of equipment and make an amazing song, you know, it really can um, be done. What about for you, man? What's, what's something that you enjoy most about making records or mixing, you know, sessions? What's, what's a favorite way to make a record for you? I think, I, I think my favorite, I, day to day, I enjoy the mixing work, I think the most because there's sort of this finality of finishing it up, you know, that feels really good. But when I'm producing, I love it when, uh, like the session I was talking about earlier with John Moen and Chris Lafalis and Warren Pash, was like, you know, just collaborative, bouncing all these ideas around that there's sort of, John's sort of the producer, but he's open to all the ideas that we're throwing around and grabbing little things from each of us. 
and putting them into the the recording, you know. And I think that's really fun because it's it, it's leading somewhere that you couldn't just get on your own. If you're the only, if the band's not even throwing ideas at you or the artist is like, I don't know, just tell me what to do. I don't really get off on that much, you know. I want to have more of that push back and forth and the yeah. collaborating and and scoring and I think a that, goal as a team, right? Yeah, and I think it's funny. I have I still haven't watched the whole thing, but the Beatles get back daily, right? That everyone has been watching or for. Yeah, I, I need to a, go watch number three too. <laughs> I have a Blu-ray of it, and I haven't even watched it. I watched, I watched the watch, I watched the first disc, I think. But I was like, "Wow, this is too much like work." But uh, <laughs> you know that that kind of working in the studio where you're adept enough that you don't need to go out and tour for like a year to get the songs tight. That you can once the ideas start to get gelled, you're going to probably start getting good takes. That's really fun to me. I really enjoy yeah. that kind of that kind of work. And and being creative and working fast, and I was doing some things like, uh, um, like I had Warren go in and play like a a Fender or a, a Wurlitzer part, and he kept doing all these different things. And I said, finally, just play really sparse middle range notes through the verse, and I ran him into Valhalla Shimmer, and it just created this big ghosty pad of sound with no original instrument in there at all. And, you know, once he started getting the gist of what I was doing, then we started building a whole new concept for the instrumentation instrumentation there. And it was great, you know. That's great. So that those are the moments I think that are the best because you're like, that wouldn't have happened with just him or just me or just yeah, Chris over or the just internet. John. Yeah, it wouldn't have happened over the internet. I'd be kind of scared to maybe mix a thing like that and send it to someone without knowing their taste, you know. And I knew Chris would probably dig it. I knew John would once he heard it. Because at first he's like, that sounds really boring, these little notes he's playing. I'm like, just a minute, just a minute. You know, I'm going to yeah. process it. <laughs> that's <laughs> you cool. know. So those moments, those are my favorite, I think, because it's like that sort of joy of discovery and, and Well, it's, it's a nice full circle for you because at the beginning of the show, you talked about the importance of building community. Yeah, there you as are. A studio <laughs> and everything. It's like, that's what it's like. It's community for yeah. the, the creative process. Yeah, you know, and yeah, and then it's like working with friends and you're you're making fun of each other and laughing and and getting burritos and it's it's a pretty good time. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, man. Well, all right, well, let me let me ask you our, our closing question and yeah. you've you've answered this before but we'll hit you again. <laughs> Take the way back studio machine huh. and you go back in time and you find young Larry or maybe you find Larry before mixing in the box or wherever <laughs> you want to find Larry. And you say, listen, here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio. Um, what advice would you, do you feel like going back and giving yourself if you could? Oh, man. I know I've probably said phase before. <laughs> 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 I probably said, figure out phase. I think phase is so important. So we're going to ignore that answer. Being uh, out of phase is just a phase. Being out of phase is just a moment in time. Um, there you go. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, uh, I would tell myself it's okay that you're recording some of these bands that are not your to your taste or all that good because you need to build up if I if I go back to like 1997 and I'm, and Elliot and I had just built the studio and I recorded some really good bands right at the gate friends of mine John Mullins band yeah. the Maroons everything really great stuff and then I recorded you know some fake grunge bands and stuff like that and 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 some of the stuff, there were some sessions I really didn't enjoy the the music. Uh, and I would tell myself, like, don't worry about it. Just just focus. Always make sure you're focusing on getting better at the part you're supposed to be doing here. Like, you're at the recording part, getting good sounds, understanding everything that's going on, understanding musical stuff, you know, like what, you know, what does staccato or legato mean or those those kind of things. Learn, learn, worry about that right now. Don't just ignore the music almost like don't, it, it sucks. Yes. But learn all that, get better at this. So the, the moments that the Decemberist or the go-betweens or pavement or, or somebody walks in the door, you can be better at your craft for them. And then start making sure you're mostly recording bands that you really like that are doing something that are going somewhere and putting records out. And that'll, and that'll happen. It'll work, you know, and that's what I would tell myself. Be patient and don't, don't be kind of, I, I think I was 
a few times not as nice to people as I should have been way back. I was yeah. working all the time. I was working like 30 days a month, you know. I remember you were such an asshole. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, but I, I definitely did the same thing. I yeah. d- I've done the same thing. You know, because like I'd record one time, I'd record, you know, something really good and then the, that I really enjoyed, let's say. And then I'd record something else and I'd be like, this isn't as good as Elliot, you know. And right. then later, later you kind of go, oh, yeah, most everything isn't as good as Elliot. <laughs> well, I mean... <laughs> That that internal, like, it's easy, maybe it's because of engineering, too, and just sitting in a studio focusing, but it's easy to have that, to let my internal dialogue run away with itself, mm-hmm. like, yeah. where I'm blaming, you know, I mean, I, I try not to do it now, but yeah. in the past, you know, early on, blaming the situation or the music or the band or the yeah. something outside of myself for, you know, my, my dissatisfaction with something. You know, it's really important to start saying no. You know, when, once you can, you know, and yeah. I couldn't initially. I, I just didn't make much money. I didn't charge much. Yeah. But I did everything. Yeah. So eventually I said, no, I I, I think maybe I could, maybe a staff, maybe one of our freelancers can do that, you know, this yeah. time. I can't do that. You know, and I, I and now I really say no. And it's, it's not even like uh, based on the music or the person or personalities or anything. It's based on whether I really see myself having time, you yeah. know, and, if, and what I'm going to, you know, if it's, if it looks like a really copacetic, perfect situation, yeah, then I'm into it. Well, you know? we, we are incredibly grateful for you taking out time to do this long form yeah. podcast with us today. Again, Larry, Man, no thank problem. you so much. No problem. Um, yeah, let the rock stars you. know where, where can they go learn more about you? I mean, you have so mm-hmm. many, you're all you. over, you know, I'm and, all you, over. and you have so many great things. And we didn't even talk yeah. about, you know, the, there's a whole side of you that's involved in teaching, too. So feel free right. to, to yeah. tell us about anything that's important to you right now. Well, I mean, if you go to larry-crane.com, um, I have a lot of information about my, you know, teaching, my my LinkedIn learning courses and stuff like that. My, uh, my virtual recording workshops have been really popular during the pandemic, and, and uh, I think those have really helped some people out. And then... Um, Mag, the magazine tape op t a p e o p dot com, uh, free subscriptions. You know, get it, rock stars. Yeah, get, get it. it. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, uh, jackpotrecording dot com for the recording studio. If you want to see that, but uh, you know, I really and I I don't spend a lot of time on social media and stuff like that. But if you go to you know, if you just email Larry at tapeop dot com, I will get that message and I read all my emails if, even if I don't. Oh, always respond but uh, <laughs> um yeah i'm super i'm super reachable is what i'm trying to say and, awesome. and I, you know i still deal with a, a lot of emails every day and it's fun to just have the discourse with everybody and, yeah well thank yeah. you again dude for being here Rockstars, thank you. you for listening larry you're awesome you've you you've, too. you're a um you're an inspiration to us all man thank i mean you. we've talked about it before but you know, me being a young guy in a studio and having Brad Jones turn around and, and hand me uh, a stapled Xerox zine and say, you should check this out. This guy's yeah. making this cool magazine out on the West Coast. We, like, have a, we have a Brad wow. Jones interview now, too. It's going to come out soon. Oh, hell yeah. Right yeah, on. finally. Finally, right? <laughs> finally. Um, great to see you again, dude. I look forward you to too. seeing you around the studio. Awesome, man. Take care. All right, man. Thank Cheers. You. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make Make great music. 
Hey, rock stars. I want to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Jay-Z Microphones, Adam Audio, Isotope, Spectra 1964, and Sampley. Plus, remember to use these coupon codes for special discounts. At isotope.com slash rockstars, use the coupon code ROCK10 for 10% off any plug-in purchase. At jzmic.com, use the code ROCKSTAR for 40% off the V47, V67, or V12 microphones. Plus, get a free shock mount worth $120. And at Sampley.app, use the coupon code RSR20 for 20% off. And at RecordingStudioRockstars.com slash Academy, use the coupon ROCKSTAR for 10% off. If you enjoy Recording Studio Rockstars, then please check out our sponsors using the link in our show notes because it's a great way to help support this show. These are all things that I use in my own studio, and I highly recommend them for your studio as well. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I want to also thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Weselchenko and Braden Stremming for additional podcast and video production. Thanks so much for listening, Rockstars, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.